the universal one, an exact science of the one visible and invisible universe of mind, and the registration of all idea of thinking, mind in light, which is matter and also energy. Walter Russell. To the one God, the universal one, this book is humbly dedicated. Preface. The Universal One was originally published in 1927 and distributed to the top scientists in the country. It is being republished at this crucial period for the sole purpose of again releasing vital new scientific knowledge to this new age of new comprehension. Today the whole world is in a state of chaos, fighting against the forces of greed, envy, jealousy and fear. Disharmony is rife. All of our human relations are in a state of violent upheaval. Civilization is in reverse. Science is being used to destroy instead of to build. We talk of world peace, yet those who are to plan the new world do not know the answer, the solution. Present knowledge of man's relation to nature and natural law which controls his human relations is as yet inadequate to meet the situation. Man is still too near his jungle to either know the law which inexorably governs his every action and that of everything in nature, or to comprehend that he must obey nature or be self-destroyed. Still dominated by jungle habits, he settles his human relations by jungle methods. Wars and world chaos will continue until new knowledge applicable to the coming new cycle of man's evolution is acquired by him. What is this new knowledge? A consistent cosmogony is sorely needed for this newly dawning day of man's exaltation, which is to come. Walter Russell spent a full seven years in writing this book. When it was first published in 1927, it won more condemnation than favour from a world which was not then as ready for it as now. The book mixed science and metaphysics in a manner which nullified its oppression upon physicists. Gradually, however, many of its then radical statements have been verified by some of the world's greatest scientists and have won him many followers. The physicist draws a sharp line between things which he can in some way detect by the evidence of his senses and things which lie beyond that evidence. There is no denial of a something beyond the range of his senses and his sensed instruments, but what may be there is conjectural and therefore inadmissible as scientific data of a reliable nature. In other words, material evidence which lies within the narrow limits of man's sense range is the only admissible evidence to science. But what about that vast range which will not respond to our sense bodies and sensed instruments? Down the ages a rare few have been permitted to sever the senses which connect matter with its motivated source in the consciousness of universal mind. These few have become conscious of the cosmos and have tried to tell the world of its simplicity. Each of these have faced an impossible task. The generalities and symbols which they did set down have been discounted and relegated to poetry or metaphysics or mysticism. Walter Russell had this same sad experience in the beginning, and all this in face of the fact that the mental state of cosmic consciousness is today admitted and desired by the greatest of the world's thinkers, although it is little understood and impossible to induce. In the month of May of 1921, the Universal One illumined my beloved husband with the cosmic knowledge contained in his immortal the divine Iliad, and commanded him to give this new scientific knowledge to aid mankind in his unfolding into a cosmic age of awareness, wherein man could become knowing man instead of sensing man. Just as the bolometer and negative have reached beyond man's visible spectrum into the heretofore unseen, so can man's increasing awareness of his relation to the source make it possible for him to reach deeper and deeper into the invisible and unseen. Such a consciousness can perceive there with other eyes that which the senses of man have no way of perceiving. For centuries science has been searching for the why of things in matter and does not seem to realise that the why is not in matter at all, nor in space. Space is as much matter 
as planets are, but of an opposite form, potential and purpose. There is something beyond the matter of galaxies and space, which the senses cannot fathom, but the consciousness can. Beyond that range lies the cause of it, the why of it. In trying to awaken within man an awareness of the source of all science and philosophy, by knowing God's way sufficiently to make them man's ways, Walter Russell has pictured the orderliness, the symmetry and the balance which all nature expresses. He explains how nature perpetually polarises and depolarises in its every expression, just as you do in your every action and in every second of your life, in your breathings, but you are not aware of it. The fulcrum from which all power springs is knowledge. When man has that omniscience which is unfolding in cosmic man, he will no longer misuse, break or disobey God's law because of being unaware of it. He will command it because he will know the law. The life and death cycles of man and of the elements of matter do not vary. They are the same, for man's body is a compound of these elements. The late Dr. Francis Trevelyan Miller, Historical Foundations, New York, wrote of Walter Russell's contributions to science as follows. You have opened the door into the infinite. Science must enter. It may hesitate, it may engage in controversy, but it cannot afford to ignore the principles you have established, which eventually will revolutionise man's concept of himself, his world, his universe, and his human problems. You have done for us in this twentieth century what Plotonomy, Euclid, Copernicus, Galileo, Kepler did for their earlier centuries, but you have further penetrated all physical barriers and extended your discoveries into definite forms of the infinite law which created our universe and keeps it in operation with mathematical precision through the millions of years. Sir Oliver Lodge once said that the physicist's type of mind could never fathom the mystery of the universe, and the great story, if it ever came at all, must be the great inspiration of some poet, painter, philosopher or saint. Less than two hundred geniuses have appeared among men since the beginning of man, and not more than four or five highly illumined mystics. To these we owe what culture the world possesses today yet our whole educational system is opposing their development and our society as a whole is more apt to demean than to glorify them it is most unfortunate that humans do not realise this sorry fact for as long as man neglects to honour his geniuses who are engaged in the arts of peace and glorifies his heroes who are most proficient in the arts of war the human race will continue to suffer the agonies of its own making. This now ending barbaric age is peopled with God-fearing men. The dawning cosmic age is being peopled with God-loving men. The coming race of men will know that love is all there is in God-nature, and that the manifestation of love is all there is in the physical universe. The law of love is rhythmic balanced interchange between all things. Upon the law of balanced interchange, this entire reciprocal universe is motivated with such exactness of balance that astronomers can calculate the positions of planets and suns to the split second. In this wise, the universe is dependable. It observes the law. It cannot do otherwise where God controls all things. In Walter Russell's worldwide acclaimed book, The Secret of Light, is the following fragment from the Divine Iliad. Again I say that all things extend to all things, from all things and through all things. For to thee I again say, all things are light, and light separates not, nor has it bounds, nor is it here and not there. Man may weave the pattern of his self in light of me, and of his image in divided lights of me, e'en as the sun sets up its bow of many hues from divided light of me. But man cannot be apart from me, as the spectrum cannot be apart from light of me. And as the rainbow is a light within the light inseparable, so is man's self within me inseparable, and so is his image my image. Verily I say, every wave encompasseth every other wave unto the one, and the many are within the one, e'en down to the least of waves of me. 
and I say further, that every thing is repeated within every other thing unto the one. And furthermore I say, that every element which man thinketh of as of itself alone is within every other element, he into the atom's veriest unit. When man queries thee in this wise, sayest thou that in this iron there is gold, and all things else? Thou mayst answer, within the sphere, and encompassing it, is the cube, and every other form that is, and within the cube, and encompassing it, is the sphere, and every other form that is. We are at the dawning of a glorious new age of knowledge, and awareness of our oneness with all life. May we bring into being, in this twentieth century, the life triumphant for all peoples everywhere, and thus fulfil our sole purpose on earth, which is to discover our divinity and live it. 1974 Printing, Leo Russell Special Notation In the interim of writing The Universal One, from 1921 to 1927, to 1947 when The Secret of Light was released, and also our book entitled Atomic Suicide, which was published in 1957, Dr. Russell's thoughts and awareness matured in expression, and he clarified and rectified errors he felt that he had committed in his earlier writings. It was never his intention to reprint the Universal One. However, because of the numerous requests that we have been receiving for copies of this great book, and because it may be of untold help at this crucial period in mankind's progress, we are reprinting it in its original form. L.R. Prelude The supreme service which man can render to evolving man is to answer for him, dynamically. The great heretofore unanswerable question concerning the one universal force which man calls God, or mind, or by other names. For long ages, man has impatiently awaited the knowledge which would tear away the veil from the invisible universe which lies beyond his perception, and bring it within the range of both his perception and his exact comprehension. Mathematical and measurable proof of the existence of but one mind, one force, and one substance would give to man absolute control over matter, the power to create, even as God creates, and within the same limitations. Man is omnipotent, when he but knows his omnipotence, until that day he is but man. Voltaire said that man could never comprehend God, for man must be God to comprehend him. Man is God, and therefore God is within the comprehension of man. Man is mind. Man is matter. Mind and matter are one. God is mind. This is a universe of mind, a finite universe, limited as to cause, and to the effect of cause. A universe of limitations cannot be infinite. There is no infinite universe. A finite universe in which the effects of cause are limited must also be limited as to cause, so when that measurable cause is known, then can man comprehend and measure all effects. The effects of cause are complex and mystify man, but cause itself is simple. The universe is a multiplicity of changing effects of but one unchanging cause. All things are universal. Nothing is which is not universal. Nothing is of itself alone. Man and mind and all creating things are universal. No man can say, I alone am I. There is but one universe, one mind, one force, one substance. When man knows this in measurable exactness, then will he have no limitations within those which are universal. He will then know that all knowledge exists within man, and is subject to his desire to recall it from within his inner mind. Knowledge is not acquired from without, but merely recollected from within. The recollection of knowledge from within is an electromagnetic process of thinking mind, which is as exactly under man's control as is the generation of the same power to turn the wheel. Man must think in light, his thinking must be in terms of the electromagnetic periodicities which measure all motion, for of such is he himself, and nothing else. To know how to think in light from within is to open the doors of all knowledge. Omnipotence lies in perfect thinking. There is no power in this universe other than the energy of thinking mind. 
thinking is the cause of motion, and the periodicities or states of motion caused by thinking mind are registered in light, which man calls matter. Matter is light. Nothing is which is not light. We are prone to think that this civilization of ours is an extremely advanced one. On the contrary, man of today is in an exceedingly primitive state of his evolution. He is a bearer of heavy burdens, sweating at heavy labour in the bowels of the earth because of his pitiful ignorance of universal power which awaits only his knowledge to render it available for his free use. Knowledge of the one thing will lift the yoke which man has placed on his own shoulders. This knowledge is herein written down in the language of a new dynamic science of new concepts, which are measurable, which explain the heretofore unexplainable. Language is lacking in words to express new knowledge. Seemingly contradictory words must be used in the hope that the intent will be understood by taking all that is herein written and putting it together, rather than in trying to find comprehension through the analysis of a few inadequate words in isolated paragraphs. For all those questions which lie unanswered within the heart of man, there is a dynamic answer, such an answer as two and two make four. Faith and theory regarding the universal one need have no place in the thinking of man. They are wanderings in the dark. All things are answerable in light. The universe is a tonal one, a dimensionless universe of light. All nature is a series of orderly tonal periodicities of the one force assembled into the complex idea of thinking mind and registered in light, or matter, or energy in interchanging potentials, all of which are variable, yet comprehensible and measurable states of motion of the one substance. All dimension is an illusion, an appearance, due to rising potential, which must disappear into its inevitable sequence of lowering potential, and again appear in endless cycles of appearance, disappearance and reappearance. Ecstatic man is he who can think in those high octaves of the inner mind, which has been termed spirit. Ecstatic man is inspired man of universal genius, of inner thinking. Inspired man is he to come whose thinking will be from within, in light, and it will be an ecstasy of thinking which will produce enduring things. That work which is created in ecstasy of inner thinking can alone endure. To think in light is not a new power being developed by evolving man. It is a power which is now within him, awaiting only his knowledge of the use of that power. It is merely the recognition by man of his absolute control of the many dimensions of the universal constant of energy, which constitutes the thinking process of mind exactly, as he can control the changing speeds of his motor car. When man can change the low speed of his objective thinking in this universe of dimension to the high speed of his inner thinking where dimension disappears in light, then he is superman, then is he universal genius. Light is the universal language in which the divine concept is plainly written. Fundamentally wrong in its basic premises and wasteful in its practice, Man's modern concept of the universe must be torn down and built again on truth as plainly told in light. Primitive in his concepts, man divides the universe into the seen and the unseen, then finds himself groping in the dark, blindfolded, hopelessly trying to find the way to the door of the Holy of Holies. There is no unseen universe. The way to that innermost sanctuary of the Most High is as clearly posted as the Lincoln Highway. But man has not been able to read the plainly worded messages written all along the way in light. Man's most wonderful of instruments, the spectroscope, has told him little, for he has not yet learned to read it. He does not know that those many lines of light are but letters of the alphabet of light, in which the Universal One registers his mighty thinking in the universal language of light. The spectrum of iron is to man naught but the spectrum of iron. To the cosmic import of those many glowing lines he is indeed blind. 
Again, in helium he reads the lines as helium's lines, and sees not in them the plain story simply told of six new elements of vast import awaiting man's use in the easing of his burden. And of the most important of the elements, which man calls the inert gases, nothing at all is known except that they will not combine with any other elements. Oh, the pity of it! Wrong concepts of the atom's structure and the modern electric theory of energy and its transmission, of conductivity, radiation and gravitation, and of that electrochemical state of opposed motion called luminosity, all of these wrong concepts of motion and of matter must be remoulded on truth. With truth comes knowledge, and with knowledge power to transmute at will, and simply plentiful substances of matter into those which are the rarest, to meet the needs of man. There is no substance which nature produces, which man cannot produce, or synthesize, or create. From apparent nothingness, when he knows that which is herein written down and charted, man's miracles of today become commonplace events of tomorrow. Civilizations come and go, exalted by man's thinking, or by it plunged into the abyss of darkened ages. This message is for all mankind, and not for the few, for it is placing within his hands a power which could either glorify or frightfully enslave him in accord with the usage of that power. Either way it matters not, for in the end truth will survive, and man will complete his destiny truth lives. There is naught but truth, and that which appears to be otherwise has no existence, and therefore is not, nor ever will be. Walter Russell In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was nothing made which was made. John I. 1 Book 1. Chapter 1. Creation Divine Mind, God, Spirit, Creation and the Order of Creation. In the beginning, God, there is but one God, there is but one universe. God is the universe. God is not one and the universe another. The universe is not a separate creation of God's. It is God. There is no created universe. Nothing is which has not always been. All created things are from the beginning. They have no beginning. They do not come into being. They are and always have been and always will be. Creation means to man the coming into existence of something which was not before in existence. Man's concept of creation is the coming into being of a physical, visible universe, heretofore non-existent. The Creator is to man's mind a sublime being, separate and apart from man, who created the physical universe of matter, causing to come into being that which had not been. Man holds the concept of two universes, a spiritual and a physical. God is presumed to be of the spiritual universe, perfect. Matter is of the physical universe, imperfect. God supposedly created the imperfect physical universe, separate and apart from himself. Man conceives a perfect and omnipotent God. A perfect and omnipotent God could not create imperfection. He could not create a lesser than himself. He could not create a greater than himself. God could not create other than himself. God did not create other than himself nor greater, nor lesser than himself. In the sense generally understood by man, God did not create anything. Nothing has been created. This is a creating universe, not a created one. Man's concept of the sublime being as the creator of a material universe, different in substance from the spiritual universe, is a misconcept. God is all there is. Beyond God there is nothing. Superior to God, there is nothing. Inferior to God, there is nothing. Opposed to God, there is nothing. Creation is not more, nor is it less than it has always been from the beginning. It cannot be more than God, nor can it be less than God. 
Creation is an apparent integration in continuity of that which already exists in substance. It is a periodic change of state of the one unchanging substance. It is evolution. The creation is an apparent disintegration in continuity of apparently integrated things returned to that substance. It is dissolution. God is in reality and exists in substance. God is thinking mind. The substance or body of God is light. The one universal substance which is God is a tangible substance, a thinking substance, comprehensible and describable and possessed of principles which are familiar to man through man's observation of the one universal substance in created things. The substance of all created things is light. The one substance of thinking mind is all that exists. The created universe is the registration in matter of the idea of thinking mind. Mind is expressed in light. Light is the storehouse of the energy of thinking mind. The energy of the universe is the energy of thinking mind. The universe is a universe of energy. Energy is expressed in light. Mind is the universe. Mind substance is spiritual substance. Spirit is light. Spirit is the ultimate, the eternal, though finite substance. Spirit is not infinite. Nothing in this universe of motion is infinite. Man's concept of an infinite God, possessing infinite knowledge and infinite power, creator of an infinite universe, of infinite extension, is not in accord with the laws of motion. This is a boundless, eternal, dimensionless universe of definite limitations, both as to all cause and to all effects of cause. Dimension is an illusion of relation of effects, which are in themselves but illusions. All cause is comprehensible too, and all effects are measurable by man. A limited measurable universe cannot be infinite, and a divinity limited as to his range of cause, which ipso facto limits the possible range of effect, cannot be infinite. Light is the living substance of mind in action. It is the creating principle of the one substance. The one substance is the etheric spiritual substance of the one universal mind. The entire created universe of all that is, ever has been or ever will be, is but the one substance in motion, light. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. John I. 5 Matter is light. God and matter are one. Spirit and matter are the same substance. That substance is light. There are not two substances in the universe. There cannot be two substances in the universe. The substance of the universal mind is a living substance. That which man calls life is an inherent property of the entirety of mind. Light is life. There is but one life in the universe. The whole of the universe is but one living, breathing, pulsing being. There are not two lives or two living beings in the universe. There are not two of anything in the universe. The universe and all that is, is one. Chapter 2. The Life Principle Life is the pulsing electromagnetic oscillation of thinking mind. All life is immortal life. There is no mortal life. Life is a vitalizing property of all matter. Life is in and of all matter. Man's concept of life is not logical. Man conceives life to be a property apart from matter, quickening compound elements of inorganic matter into living, functioning organic beings. Man defines organic matter as that in which life begins to function, imbuing it with vitality and intelligence. Man defines inorganic matter as those elements or compounds of matter in which there is no life and in which there is no vitality nor intelligence. Man conceives life as spontaneously generated in matter at favourable temperatures and under favourable conditions. Such concepts are not true concepts. 
In searching for the life principle, man is attempting to discover something corresponding to a germ which quickens lifeless matter. Life is not a germ, and no matter is lifeless. Life is in and of all things, from the beginning, always and forever. Life has no beginning, life has no ending, life is eternal. Life is in and of all inorganic as well as all organic matter. Life is in and of all of the elements and the atoms of the elements and the compounds of the elements. Life is in and of the sun of the atom, the planets of the atom and the heavens surrounding the universe of the atom. Life is the effect produced on the substance of mind by the sequence of alternating electromagnetic pulsations which constitute the process of thinking. The progress of this effect is registered in integrating light and manifests itself in that orderly periodic phenomenon inherent in all matter and all things which man calls growth. All growing things are imbued with the life principle. All things are growing things. All matter is evolving. All matter is growing. All matter is living. Life is merely the registration in matter of states of motion of thinking mind. The substance of mind has the appearance of many states of motion which man calls the elements of matter. The elements of matter do not vary in substance. They vary only in their states of motion. All motion is periodic and evolutionary. All motion is motion in equilibrium. No other motion is possible. All motion has the appearance of being divided into opposites. These opposites of motion shall henceforth be termed motion in inertia and motion in opposition. All that appearance which man calls matter is motion in opposition. Motion in opposition is under either preponderantly electric or magnetic domination. It is a state of motion where pressures are unequalised and sustained in their state of unequalisation by the resistance of the two opposing forces in motion. The point of maximum motion in opposition is the nuclear centre of a unit or system where opposing pressures reach their point of maximum pressure. Form of matter disappears into motion in inertia. Motion in inertia is equally electric and magnetic. Neither force dominates. It is a state of motion where pressures are equalised. Man's concept of life is energised organic substance. Man's concept of death is de-energised organic substance. There is no death. Life is eternal. The one substance of the universe cannot become de-energised. Man's concept of life belongs to motion in opposition. Man's concept of death belongs to motion in inertia. Life belongs, in principle, to motion. This is a universe of motion. The cause of all motion is the dynamic action of thinking of the one universal living being, which man calls God, or mind, or by other names, all of which stand practically for the one idea of fatherhood, or deity, Thinking is a process, an orderly evolutionary periodic process of absolute limitations. All motion of thinking mind is born in the maximum high speed of the universal constant of energy. It runs the gamut of periodic and opposing deceleration and acceleration in sixfold tones, one double tone and a master tone, to each of ten lowering octaves and a variable number of mid-tones in each of the last four octaves. The seven tones are those so-called elements of matter which are improperly classified in the eight groups of the commonly accepted Mendeleev periodic table. All effects of motion which cause the appearance of these elements is that which is herein termed motion in opposition. The master tone of each octave is the record of all motion taking place within the octave. The master tones are the turning points between reaction and action, just as the double tones are the turning points between action and reaction. They are the beginnings of each new expression of energy in motion, and are records of the old. 
They are the ends of exhalations and the beginnings of inhalations. The master tone of each octave is the inheritance of the original motion of the thinking process of mind. These master tones are the inert gases which are classified in the zero group of the Mendeleev table. The state of motion of these inert gases is that of motion in inertia. Motion in inertia is that state of pressure equilibrium which lies between any two masses. The inertial line or plane is that dividing line or plane toward which all masses discharge their potential. It is the line or plane of lowest potential of two opposing areas of potential, where opposing pressures neutralise. This is the plane of minimum pressure of two opposing areas. The master tones which represent a state of motion in inertia and are the inert gases bear the same relationship to the elements that white bears to the colours. They are a registration of them all. White is not included in the spectrum, it has no place there. The inert gases should not be included in the elements, they have no place there. Of this more shall be written later in its proper place. The ten octaves constitute a cycle of evolving states of motion. This cycle includes the uttermost limitations of divine possibilities, and beyond it nothing is or can be. The cycle begins with the highest note and descends the scales sequentially through man's unseen universe until hydrogen, the first element perceivable to man, is reached. The illustration is a reproduction of the Mendeleev periodic table of the elements as published in the modern textbooks. It is the present chemical record of the visible universe or the range of matter within the perception of man as of the year 1904, and to which very slight modifications have since been added. It is correct only in the orderly periodicity of atomic weight, which is mass dimension. In all other dimensions and periodicities it is wrongly arranged. There is no eighth group. All marked with a circle are out of place in octave periodicity, and those marked with an X are properly placed. The inert gases of the zero group are incomplete, and three and a half octaves are missing. This chart is not a workable or practical chart for chemists' use, for it in no way relieves them of the necessity of experimenting in their laboratories to find out that which should be known in advance of experimenting. All periodicities of all effects of motion can be properly arranged on a workable and dependable chart, such as that which has been herein published. Incomplete as this chart is, Duncan says of it in The New Knowledge, this periodic law of the atoms is God's alphabet of the universe. By means of it, and by means of it only, can we ever hope to spell out the history and the future of creation. It lies here before us, lacking only the master word, the open sesame to creation, and who knows, to the creator too. There is no unseen universe. Those tones which follow hydrogen are man's visible or physical universe of matter, and continue into the tenth octave. Here elemental integration and disintegration have ended the cycle by the attainment of the equilibrium of its beginning. All motion is oscillatory, swinging in sequence between two apparently opposing forces, gravitation and repulsion, which are respectively electric and magnetic. This oscillatory motion is a pulsating, in-breathing and out-breathing, an inhalation and an exhalation which is characteristic of all matter, whether it be in units or systems of units or mass. These two apparently opposite forces are the father-mother forces of mind, which added together make but the one force. There is but one pendulum to the cosmic clock. All this so-called created universe of matter is but the effect of these two apparently opposing male-female forces exerting their opposition. All motion in opposition is both gravitative and repulsive. This is characteristic of all matter. Motion at the inertial line or plane where mass disappears is neither gravitative nor repellative. Hence the master tones which register effects of motion on this line or plane 
should not be included in the table of elements. All matter is characterised by periodic and alternating opposites of motion in sequence, each opposite being preponderant in sequence. Each opposite force is the cause of the other. Opposition is a characteristic appearance of all effects of motion and has no existence other than as an appearance. In inertia this appearance always disappears. Motion and matter must not be confounded. Matter as man understands matter is only an appearance due to states of motion. The creation of form in matter is the apparent integration of these things which are and always have been. The decreation of form in matter is the apparent disintegration of apparently integrated things. Creation is transmutation or integration of the one simple indivisible substance into the appearance of many complex substances and things. Creation may be likened unto the assembling of a few letters of type for the printing of a very complex idea. Decreation may be likened unto the redistribution of type after it has served its purpose of giving expression to idea on the printed page. Matter is light crystallised into the complex idea of this universe, exactly as literature is type assembled into the complex ideas of a library. Matter is the registration medium of light, just as letters are the registration medium of literature. Matter is light gravitationally assembled into the appearance of form, and radially disassembled into the disappearance of form. The assembling process is what man calls life. The disassembling process is what man calls death. Light exists as light always and forever. All matter is but a variation of the state of light due to variation of dimension of the evidence of motion in the wave by which all motion is expressed. To man, matter means the complexity of many substances and many things. Complexity and variability belong to motion and not to substance. There is but one unchanging substance. The appearance of change does not belong to substance but to motion. Man lives in a universe of motion, a universe of appearances and illusions which deceive him, except for those simple obvious illusions with which he becomes perfectly familiar. Man will stoutly aver that matter changes, and that there are many substances, but he would not dream of contending that the moon runs along the road behind the trees as he runs, yet one contention would be as reasonable as the other. Matter and mind and light and energy are eternal, they are constant, they are cause, form and motion are illusions, they are fleeting, they are effects. Chapter 3 Mind, the one universal substance. Mind is the universe. It is all that is, ever was, or ever will be. Mind is a substance, a material substance. The substance of mind is the foundation of creation. It is the seed of the universe. In the seed of the universe is the whole of the universe. The substance of universal mind has no beginning, no ending, and no bounds. It is all intelligent, all powerful, and all present. The one substance is absolutely frictionless, temperatureless, non compressible, non expandable, non absorbent, non reflectant, non resistant, and non refractive, but potentially it contains the appearance of all these qualities through the dynamic action of those opposing forces within it which cause it to be a thinking substance in motion. These qualities belong to motion and appear only through motion in opposition. They are not qualities which belong to the one substance. They are appearances which disappear in the inertial plane of pressure equilibrium, which lies between any two masses. Hence they have no existence other than as an appearance of existence. The cause of the appearance of change of the one substance is through change of state, but change of state is not change of substance. Change of state is not an attribute of substance, it belongs to motion. It is an illusion of motion which creates the illusion of dimension. The substance of mind is the one pre-chemical substance, which is the source of all the elements, and the compounds of the elements, all of which are but appearances.
These appearances register the action of the process of thinking and disappear back into their source of an absolute temperatureless state of motion in inertia. The material substance of mind is an all-pervading ether which is indivisible, inseparable, indestructible, unalterable and unchangeable, but potentially it contains the appearance of all these dimensions of separability in the states of motion which register the dynamic process of thinking. The words spirit and ether are used to express the tenuity of the dimensionless universe, as solidity is used to express the compactness of the apparently measurable universe. States of motion in opposition cause the appearance of change from the state of motion in non-opposition or inertia into the appearance of separability into parts. This results in such effects of motion as heat, cold, colour, form, sex, growth, valence, ionisation, mass, gravity, radiation and many others. These effects are not a change of substance, nor do they divide alter or separate the one substance of mind, they are but dimensions. All effects have the appearance of dimension, they are in themselves but dimensions of that which they appear to be. The cause of all effects is dimensionless, cause is existent. Effect is an illusion of existence, it but appears to exist. Change of state appears to change the character of the one substance, but appearances have no existence. Man is accustomed to appearances. Two objects exactly similar appear dissimilar in perspective. This is a universe of appearances, all of which are relative, and not one of which would have even the appearance of existence without the relation of others. Without the illusion of separability, space could not be. Without events, time could not be. Without motion in opposition, neither heat, cold, colour, sex, mass, or any of the effects of thinking could be or appear to be. Without the variability of motion in opposition, there could be no appearance of variability in the chemistry of the one substance. Man's many elements are but variances in states of motion in opposition of the one unchanging substance. They all appear to have separate and distinct characteristics of their own in varying degrees, such as melting points, specific gravity, atomic weight, volume, ionisation, stability, valence, electromagnetic charge, axial rotation, orbital revolution and many other characteristics which give them the appearance of being separate and different substances. They are neither separately created individual things nor are they different substances. Their appearance of separability and difference of substance is due solely to the periodicity of states of motion in opposition. The universal substance of light is a material substance of variable motion, which is due to the variability of opposition, set up by the two apparently opposing forces of action and reaction, which constitute the thinking process. It is apparently shorn or torn into apparent particles of itself during the process of creative thinking, but actually is unseparated and undivided in the process of that shearing or tearing. It is without form, but potentially it contains all that man calls form. Form is but an appearance, an effect of motion in opposition. The greater the opposition of the two opposing forces, the greater the rigidity of form and mass, and the more distinctive is its appearance of existence. All of those elements between the third gravitational and third radiational tones, the atomic structures of which are very much contracted in volume, and represent motion in maximum opposition, are the hard, dense, heavy solids of great rigidity. Such metals, for example, as iron, copper, gold, silver, manganese, nickel and tungsten, the elements which form such compounds as granite, quartz and flint, and those elements which form such precious stones as the diamond, ruby and emerald, all these elements are made up of light units in maximum motion in opposition. They are very densely packed together in atomic construction and very closely integrated.
Their electric and magnetic orbits are in spirals of one plane and are very much extended. Their melting points are very high. A study of the charts will show this clearly. The less the opposition of the two opposing forces, the less the rigidity of form and mass, and the more indistinct is its appearance of existence. All of those elements which born near the inertial planes of their octaves indicate by their tonal position on their octave waves a close relation to motion in inertia, and a lessening degree of opposition are the softer, less distinct substances. Such elements and compounds as lithium, bromine, sodium, chlorine, salt, sulphur, potassium, iodine, tellurium, magnesium, strontium and rubidium are formed of light units of less potential energy. The atomic structure of these elements is not closely integrated, but is open, nebulous and very much expanded. Their electric and magnetic orbits are in spirals of many planes, approaching nebulosity in appearance as their position nears their inertial planes. Their melting points are very low. A study of the charts will show this clearly. Form, therefore, is not an attribute of the one substance and has no existence other than as an appearance. Form, like time, space, mass, colour, weight, temperature and other effects of motion, is an attribute of motion only and in no way an attribute of substance. Bubbles whirling in the substance of water have form. Their form is but an attribute of their whirling motion and is not of the substance of water. When the motion ceases, form disappears, but the substance remains. Creation is merely a swing of the cosmic pendulum from inertia through energy and back again to inertia, forever and forever. It is but a series of opposing pulsations of action and reaction, integration and disintegration, gravitation and radiation, appearance and disappearance. The one universal mind is a formless thinking substance. If the one substance were not a thinking substance, that which man calls creation would not have been. That which man calls God is an ecstatic thinking substance, thinking in continuity, thinking rhythmically, thinking with orderly variation of intensity, in measurable impulses throughout endless ages in endless space. Thinking is an action which is the cause of all motion. It is a process, a purely mechanical process, periodic in its evolution through one cycle after another, without end. The process of thinking leaves the evidence of that process behind it, registering the effect of its passage through the ocean of the universal mind. In its wake are myriads of rotating particles of the one substance, which register the thinking of mind, just as in the wake of an ocean steamer are myriads of tiny rotating bubbles which register the passage of that steamer. The many bubbles in the wake of the steamer produce an effect of foam in the ocean substance which appears to be different from the surrounding substance. It is the same substance but of less stability. The whirling bubbles of foam owe their appearance of stability to motion. When the motion ceases, the bubbles will disappear. The wake of the steamer is an appearance which we know will disappear. It has no stability. It has only an appearance of stability. The bubbles are apparently separate individuals possessing form and motion, which are apparently their own, but which we know are not their own. Their appearance of separateness, we know, is but an illusion due to force and motion. When the churning effect of the propeller has been dissipated, foam, bubbles, wake and all will disappear into the mighty ocean of which they are a part, and from which they have never been separated. The passage of all thought through the tranquil ocean of universal mind may well be likened unto the passage of big boats and little boats and all the winds of heaven upon the tranquil ocean of waters. The passage of all these forces leave their effects in appearance upon the ocean of waters, registering thereon in foam the idea of those forces. Without the exertion of these forces upon the tranquil waters, an absolute uniformity of appearance would prevail throughout the ocean of waters. Without the force of thinking throughout the tranquil substance of mind, there would be no appearance of variability whatsoever in the universe of mind 
there would be no form. The distinct spiral nebula of Perseus, or the trail of the Milky Way looming against the ocean of mind, is exactly analogous to the foamy wake of a steamer, as viewed from a great height. Both the wake of the steamer and the nebula of Perseus are appearances due to the passage of ponderous ideas, and both will disappear back into the substance of which they are a part. The myriad whirling spheres of the nebula, its integrating suns and solar system, its planets and moons, its asteroids and meteorites, are all whirling forms born of the churning propeller of the one mind, thinking out this universe of ours. Similarly, the whirling spheres of the steamer's wake, with its big bubbles, its lesser bubbles, and its milky foam, are a line of white against the deep blue sea, but not separate from the sea in substance. The temperature in the wake of the steamer is higher than that of the surrounding water. Similarly, the temperature of the spiral nebula is higher than that of the surrounding ether matter, because of the heat energy generated by thinking and transferred to the whirling spheres. The law governing both bubbles and nebula is the same. The difference between them is only relative in point of time. Both disappear when they cease to whirl, for their appearance of existence is due solely to the heat energy of motion. A bubble may whirl for a few moments, and a sun for a hundred billion years before their generated heat becomes radiated into their father-mother substance which gave them birth. The difference in time is but relative, for time is nothing in eternity. When the bubbles have radiated their heat to the temperature of the surrounding water, they cease all appearance of individual existence. Their forms have disappeared with cessation of motion, but their substance is as existent as the ocean is existent. When giant suns have radiated their heat to the absolute zero of the surrounding ether substance of mind, they cease all appearance of individual existence. Their forms have disappeared with the cessation of motion, but their substance is as eternal as mind is eternal. Chapter 4. Thinking Mind the process of thinking is a simple one. It is a swing of the cosmic pendulum from the stability of mind substance to apparent instability and back again to stability. The registration of this effect in the ocean of universal mind is contained within the form of an elongated sphere and all its variability and complexity may be read upon two exactly opposite spiral waves within two halves of that sphere light heat electricity magnetism form crystallization sound mass the elements and compounds of elements time space attraction gravitation force energy inertia sex life death sleep memory the souls of all things and the complex ideas of all things in fact all that man can comprehend of this universe can be spelled out in their beginnings on these two opposing spiral waves within one sphere and on through to their endings in nine other increasingly larger though flattening spheres or ellipsoids these two opposing spiral waves within one sphere represent the entire simple process of thinking, but not the entire variability of the effect of thinking. They represent the beginning or highest octave in the cycle of thinking, of which there are ten. The simple process of thinking is repeated exactly in the ten octaves, but with periodic variability and complexity of registered effect. All variability and complexity of registered effect is orderly in variation and complication, and thus are all effects comprehensible to that man who has knowledge of the cause of those effects. Everywhere throughout its entirety, the mind substance is in constant agitation, undergoing the orderly process of thinking. The force called thinking, which impels mind into concentration and decentration in sequence, is the only energy of the universe. There is no other energy. The universe is mind only. The universal constant of energy registers in the substance of mind the illusions caused by the thinking of mind. Every microscopic point in divine mind becomes the centre of the universe of mind. 
with its first impulse of the act of thinking, for with this first impulse is form born into a universe which is without form. From that centre of explosive reactive, genera radiative, electromagnetic disturbance, which constitutes the process of thinking, reproduces itself throughout the entirety of the universe at incomprehensible speed in waves of creating light units, which waves return again to that exact centre. Thinking is an action followed by a reaction of that action. The action of thinking constitutes a series of events in sequence. The intervals between events in sequence constitute that effect of motion, called time. Without a sequence of events, time could not be, for there would be nothing to mark time. Time begins with the action of thinking. It is an effect which appears with motion in opposition and disappears into motion in inertia. The events in sequence which give birth to that appearance called time are the opposing pulsations of generative and radiative light. These opposing pulsations give dimension and form to that which man calls life. To man there is no life without form. Form and dimension are fleeting. Life is eternal. Life is merely the action of thinking, and thinking is as eternal as the thinking substance of mind is eternal. Universal thinking is rhythmic thinking. The entire substance of universal mind is thinking in varying but orderly rhythmic meter. The meter of universal thinking is measurable in its orderliness throughout the entirety of the universal substance. The tempo of the cosmic rhythmic meter of thinking is absolute. All thinking is expressed in measurable and opposing impulses of opposing motion. All motion is action and reaction. Chapter 5. The Process of Thinking The action impulse and the reaction impulse of the thinking process are alternating between the apparent opposites, known as generation and radiation. Generation and radiation are opposites, which constitute the appearance of motion in opposition. Generation is the attractive, gravitative, positive electric force, and radiation is the repulsive, emanative, negative, magnetic force. All motion, whether in opposition or in inertia, is in equilibrium. That is to say, the amount of energy expended in any two opposite swings of the cosmic pendulum is always quantitatively constant. The apparent variation is in the dimension of the two opposing swings and is not of the constant of energy. The amount of generative and radiative energies expended in the two opposing oscillations anywhere in the entire ten octaves, when added together, total the same in the amount of energy expended. Motion in inertia is characterised by an absolute lack of what man calls valence, which is grabbing power, or uniting power. All of the elements of matter, in motion in opposition, have this uniting power in varying degree, or periodicity, just as they have periodicity in electromagnetic charge and other variations. Hence, a further reason for disassociating the inert gases or master tones from the elements. Opposing impulses of thinking are generated out of inertia and radiated back into equalisation in inertia. These impulses are alternating between generation and radiation in a periodicity of preponderance, which periodicity is measurable by man in many ways. All matter is apparently evolving and evolving into the illusion of many substances of many dimensions. So-called solids of matter are variations of apparent states of motion, registering in form the idea of thinking mind, and sustained in their appearance as solids of matter by electric preponderance over magnetism. The electric nature of matter in its progressive periodicity and variation of electromagnetic charge, rotation of its light units and other periodicities will be written down with more exactness when the process of thinking is more explicitly written down and charted. Suffice it here to say that thinking is the electrogenerative action and magnetoradiative reaction of mind. 
thinking is a simple process of very complex effects, the sequence of which will be written in its proper place. The electromagnetic opposition of mind, as expressed in the process of thinking, is the source of all of the energy of the universe. Thinking, then, is a process of generation of motion in variable opposition, out of a state of maximum motion in non-variable inertia, and of radiation back again into that state. The inertial line is that hypothetical line of absolute non-opposition between the oscillations of the two opposing forces of motion. At the inertial line, the two opposing forces are neutralised and in equilibrium. At the inertial line, there is no force back of motion, but there is the impetus of the magnetic radiative pulsation, which continues motion across the inertial line without force. Once across the line, motion is continued by the electrogenerative pulsation until magnetic conquest causes it to rebound. That state of motion which continues motion without force back of it will be known as inertial energy. The inertial line or plane might be characterised as the axis along which wave expressions of the universal constant of energy are born. The mechanic might characterise it as the dead centre between force and force where no force exists. This point can only be passed by the impetus given to an object in motion prior to its arrival at that point. Motion is continuous as thinking is continuous. The universe breathes, inhaling and exhaling, as man breathes, and as every light unit, atom and molecule breathes, and as everything in the firmament above, and the waters below breathes. Exhalation and inhalation in sequence is a characteristic of all phenomena of matter. Motion is caused by the sequence of opposing impulses of thinking. All direction of motion and effects of motion are governed by these equally balanced gravitative and repulsive and equally balanced decelerative and accelerative forces. The opposition of the two apparently opposing forces, which cause apparently opposite impulses, forms spiral waves along which the idea produced in thinking is registered. The registered idea of thinking is expressed gravitatively in what man calls the elements of matter and repulsively in what man calls the magnetic flow, or magnetic lines of force, in heretofore unknown magnetic orbits. All elements of matter are radiative or radioactive, just as all matter is generative or generoactive. Electrically generating elements and magnetically radiating lines of force are the same force exerted in apparently opposite directions. The former is centripetal, and its direction is toward the nuclear centre of a closing spiral. The latter is centrifugal, and its direction is away from the centre, toward the opening spiral. The difference is but a rising or lowering of potential. One always becomes the other. Each is the cause of the other. Radioactivity is a lowering of potential into five higher octaves of elements of greater speed, but lesser power. Generoactivity is the increasing of potential into lower octaves of greater power and lesser speed. Generoactivity builds the elements. Radioactivity tears them apart. The elements are composed of apparently separate particles in motion, which shall henceforth be called light units or corpuscles. The spiral generoradiative waves are the medium of reproduction of idea throughout the entirety of the universe. All idea of mind produced by thinking is reproduced throughout the entirety of the universe of mind in measurable waves of electromagnetic opposition. These apparently opposing generoradiative waves constitute the creating and decreating universe of integrating and disintegrating elements of potential energy which man calls the created physical universe. Man has measured the speed at which the energy of light appears to travel along waves as 186,400 miles per second. This measure is the highest measure of the perceptible impulses of universal thinking. This is the measure of energy reproduction, which man calls the speed of light. Man's concept of the speed of light as being uniform is a wrong concept. 
To man, light is incandescent luminosity. To man, that which is not glowingly incandescent is not light. All matter is light. This universe is one of light. Solids of matter, heavy, dark and cold, are as much light as flaming Arcturus. Luminosity is but a state of intensely unequalised and opposing motion, sustained in its state of unequalised motion by the generation of high pressures. It is but one state of the substance of mind in motion, a state which is within a limited range of electromagnetic charge, temperature and opposition, a range which varies in intensity in each octave, but which runs the whole gamut of its limitations in the ten-octave cycle. Incandescent luminosity is but the state of maximum opposition of the two apparently opposing forces, and a state in which radiative resistance to generation is at its maximum, a state in which contraction by maximum genero-active accumulation of time into power is resisting expansion by radiative dissipation of power into time, of which much will be written in its proper place. Incandescent luminosity is that state of motion which will be known as the high potential of a system or an octave. It is the meeting place of centripetal and centrifugal forces, of preponderantly male and preponderantly female, of maximum electromagnetic opposition, and it is the state of maximum registration of heat. It is the turning point where the power of electricity to generate mind substance into the appearance of form yields to the power of magnetism to radiate it back into the disappearance of form. Man's speed of light is the speed at which that state of motion in opposition, known as incandescent luminosity, appears to travel through those high octaves of integrating matter, which man calls empty space, or the ether of space. This measure of light is but the high measure of a great range of apparent speeds. All of the elements of matter, in all states of motion, are but orderly and periodic variations of the one substance, light. As there are innumerable states of motion of substance of light, so are there also innumerable so-called speeds of light. All of the elements of matter are spread out progressively, in varying states of simultaneously decelerative and accelerative motion in opposition, on the ten-octave waves, like successive tones of music, all motion in opposition is simultaneous in its opposition. The state of luminosity belongs to all of the elements, and varies with the state of integration of each element. It is periodic and orderly in its variation, as the elements are periodic and variable in their integrative weight or mass. Matter which is apparently non-luminous is simply matter which has become sufficiently retarded generatively and sufficiently expanded radiatively to bring it below the range of motion in opposition, which produces the appearance of luminosity. All solids of matter are but integrated light, the generative units of which are sufficiently retarded in their motion and their resistance to integration sufficiently extended in magnetic orbits to bring them below the range of the state of apparent luminosity. Chapter 6. Thinking is registered in matter. It has elsewhere been written that matter is the registration of the divine idea of thinking mind. Man is familiar with the thinking process in his own daily experiences. Consider for a moment the concentrative thinking of man in conceiving idea. Is not the idea at first nebulous, and as man concentrates electrically in his thinking, is not the idea more and more distinct in form? And does not that form remain clear and distinct so long as man concentrates dynamically upon thinking that idea? When man's concentration relaxes, does not the idea become more and more nebulous in form, and more indistinct, until it is but a memory? Just so with the thinking of the one universal mind. The concentration of all mind is electropositively registered in motion, and its intensity and relaxation of intensity are chemically noted in states of motion of the very mind substance which performs the action and reaction of the thinking process.
The intense concentrated expression of idea in generative thinking is chemically registered in definite, distinct, rigid form, while the relaxed, less intense expanding expression of idea in electronegative radiative thinking is chemically registered in indefinite, indistinct, nebulous form. If the universal mind is without form within itself, if its light units and mass are but appearances of form due to motion and not to substance, so also is mind in its entirety without form or shape or size. The universe of mind is neither bounded nor boundless, for it has no extension or continuation. Apparent separability is a necessary quality in creating the illusion of a universe of extension or continuation. The one substance of divine mind is non-separable, non-extendable and non-continuous. The apparent parts of mind have an apparent relationship to one another, as the appearance of separability of the mind substance is but an effect of motion, then also is the appearance of relationship of one apparent part to another, but an illusion due to motion. Relationship of matter is but an appearance and has no existence, and that which man calls relativity is but an illusion, just as that which man calls perspective is but an illusion. Relativity is the science of an illusion in four dimensions, as perspective is in three. God is light. Light as man knows light is but an unstable simulation of the real light of the universal one. Man's concept of light is luminosity, an illusion of the universal light of inertia, sustained in its appearance as an illusion of light by the pressures generated through motion. The inner mind of ecstatic man knows the real light and that he is one with light. He is not deceived by its illusion. Chapter 7 Concerning Appearances During man's evolution in a universe of motion, the complexity of appearances have bewildered him into forming one concept of reality and unreality. Man's life has been given so ardently to the observance of complex phenomena of appearances that appearances have become his facts, and the one reality has become mere conjecture. Man thinks of dependability in terms of solids, those apparent things which respond to his senses. His dependable reality is form in matter. Man thinks undependability in terms of things etheric, those things which do not respond to his senses. His unreality is spirit. Man must learn to alter his concept of the reality of solidity, to the reality of mind as the source of the illusion of that solidity. He must learn that the one substance of mind is the only reality. He must learn to consider form as only an appearance of reality in a lower octave of the material substance of mind, over which he has control within the limitations of mind. He must learn to consider matter as the substance of mind, and form in matter as but the registration of his thinking. He must learn that he is mind, and that mind is omnipresent, omniscient and omnipotent. Until man learns that he is mind, he will be the slave of the illusions of mind, instead of which he may be their master, and the creator of these illusions. Man's universe is a universe of motion. Man's body is an aggregate of particles in motion. Man is accustomed to motion. His mind is adjusted to apparent facts of matter, which cannot be actual facts, for they are all conditioned by space, time and motion. A conditioned fact cannot be a fact. It merely appears to be a fact. That a certain ball weighs a pound is a conditioned fact. Apparently the ball does weigh that much. The fact is conditioned upon keeping the ball at the same distance from the ground. Lift it one foot and it weighs less than a pound. Keep it at the same height and still its weight varies with the movement of the stars in space. That a ball drops to the ground in a vertical line is a conditioned fact. Apparently the ball does drop straight toward the earth. In reality the line is curved. The curve being conditioned by the rotation of the earth and its movement through space. This idea may be clarified by imagining a man suddenly created, full grown and highly educated. This man differs from other men in only one respect. 
he has not had a lifetime during which to adjust his mind to the relativity of things in his universe of motion as others have had he knows all the supposed facts of things but he has still to learn their apparent relationships he has yet to find that things seem to be what he knows they are not such a man would find himself in a most bewildering world a world of very complex effects of very simple causes he knows that men are about the same size yet before him is a giant a huge man among pygmies the man ten feet away must be a dwarf and the group across the street mere toys the sun he knows to be vast hot and white and the world small in comparison yet the sun is only a dinner plate and deliciously warm though it turns red and plunges into the sea the world is huge and has swallowed the little sum he knows the world is round but here it is before him flat a speck appears upon the horizon it can be nothing in an hour it is a little boat like those in a children's pond to be carried home on the end of a string yet there are a thousand tons in that toy and fifty men curse up wind as they reef their sails with the brine of the wind in their eyes and the howl of the wind in their ears the moon rushes out from behind the hill and runs as he runs and stops as he stops just a little moon it is with toy mountains it runs away and hides behind some chimney pots that mountain is blue and this one green that one is flat like a stage drop scene this one has fields with grey stone walls and roads with many trees that is a very little mountain for lo the ox on the ridge has blotted it out it is gone no here it is back again and the ox has gone where did the mountain go how did it come back and where has the ox gone the road on the opposite hill stands on its end but it lowers itself as he goes down the road on his hill and the opposite hill itself flattens it squats down behind the trees on his road or do the trees rise up and grow gigantic as he moves the iron rails spreading wide at his feet meet in a point out there a railroad train grows from a speck to a match to a box and thunders past a ponderous thing shaking the earth in its fearsome passing what magician has wrought this miracle this new-made man knows of the mystery of ten billion suns which blaze in the firmament of night their hot fire pits swirl in hundred thousand mile pools of swirling where is the glory of these fearsome orbs their ardent fires are twinkling candles snuffed out by breathing of soft-blown winds the milky way is but a mist blown across the darkness of night for such a man time only could adjust his mind to the relativity of appearances and the conditions of facts ah will the universe of man is but a kaleidoscope turning ever turning and complexing with its turning chapter eight the sex principle sir oliver lodge points out that man has long been familiar with force and motion but that some third intangible undiscovered force is recognisedly necessary to complete a logical universe force and motion infer that the third undiscovered force is existence somewhere back of or with them he also states that when discovered it may prove to be something with which man is already familiar sex is the great third principle sex is the controlling cause of both force and motion without it neither could continue to say that mind is the motive power back of force and motion is but stating a generality but to state an attribute of mind by means of which force and motion are controlled is being specific sex is the motive power behind force and motion sex is the apparent division of the father-mother substance of mind into apparent opposites this division is due to the opposite desires of electricity and magnetism expressed in the action and reaction of the thinking process sex is the active desire of mind for division into opposites and its reactive desire for unity sex is that motive force which demands separability into two and equally desires union of the apparent two into one 
mind being one, cannot yield to the desire of mind for separation into two. Sex desire of mind for divisibility into two succeeds only in producing an appearance of divisibility into two. Likewise, sex desire of mind for unity into one succeeds only in reproducing an apparent composite of the two. Sex is of all things from the beginning. Sex begins when light begins. Sex is the desire for the appearance of being which constitutes the appearance of existence. Nothing can be without the desire to be. All things are which desire to be. Desire dominates all thinking. Desire dominates all matter. All desire is sex desire. All desire is for the continuance of existence in the orderliness of existence. Sex desire is that force in thinking which continues thinking. Existence is continued only through thinking. Sex force is that quality in the electromagnetic impulse of thinking which continues one impulse of thinking into the next impulse of thinking. Sex force, like all phenomena of motion, is periodic. Sex periodicity continues the simple beginning of idea into the complexity of idea. Sex force is the builder of the apparently many things out of the reality of the one thing. Periodic variance of sex is the father of desire for the creation of the idea of many things. Remove the image-making faculty of the father force of mind and the production of idea would discontinue. Variance of sex is the mother of desire for unity of sex. Remove the sex desire of mind for the unity of oneness of the mother force of mind and reproduction of the idea of mind would discontinue. Matter cannot continue its appearance of existence as form without the desire to continue such an appearance of existence. The material substance of mind cannot evade its materialization into the form desired by mind. This is an immutable law to which there can be no exception. Man's concept of sex as beginning with organic life is a wrong concept. Sex is as absolute in the elements as in the complexities and compounds of the elements. Man's concept of the beginning of sex and the beginning of life is a concept founded on conditions of temperature. Sex and life and light and intelligence are in and of all things from the beginning. The sex principle is as much a part of the granite rock or bar of iron as it is of man. The great hot star called Argo, blazing away at a temperature of 30,000 degrees, knows sex in its fiery heat and cannot continue its appearance without it. The Martian ice cap knows sex in its frozen depths and retains its appearance because of sex. Sex is an electromagnetic equaliser of matter in motion. Sex is the apparent division of the one force into electricity and magnetism, two opposite forces, positive and negative, which are in reality but two pulsations of the one force. Sex is the apparent division of all things into their opposites, male and female. Sex is evolutionary in all things. All things are both male and female. All creation is first male in preponderance, then it is similarly female. All light units and systems of light units are first male female, then they are female male. Apparent opposites of the indivisible substance of universal mind are not content to remain in the state of apparent opposition. Unity, or oneness, inherent in all things, asserts itself in dissatisfaction when electromagnetic forces of matter in motion are sufficiently generative to cause too great an inequality between the apparent opposites. Sex is unsatisfied when the electromagnetic forces of matter in motion are unequal, and it is satisfied when those forces are equal. A lightning flash is the power of sex equalising positive and negative electromagnetic disturbances of equilibrium between two oppositely and unequally charged storm clouds. In motion in inertia, sex desire is negative. In motion in opposition, sex desire is positive. It is dynamic. 
sex first asserts itself in form. All form appears through sex, passes through a progressive charge called growth, and disappears. All growth is impelled by force and motion, and controlled by sex. Neither sex nor force nor motion is of itself alone. Each is of the others. Nothing is of itself alone. There can be no force without thinking. There can be no motion without the force of thinking. There can be no idea of mind without sex opposition. There can be no continuity of idea without sex union. Without union in mating, the idea of any one thing would be extinct as an appearance. Thinking and working are the causes of those elements which man calls sex, force and motion. Without all three of these there could be no appearance of existence, as man knows existence. Thinking and working continue the appearance of all idea from the high to the low octaves of creation. All creating things are but the ideas of divine mind. The whole idea of all things is in the seed of all things. In the seed of idea is the whole of idea. In the seed of the oak is the whole of the oak. In the seed of the rose is the whole of the rose. In the seed of man is the whole of man. The seed of all idea is in thinking. The whole idea of the oak or the rose or man is the result of thinking and working for perhaps a billion years of continuing the idea of the oak, the rose or man in the seed thereof. This is the law of evolving existence. It is as true of complex as it is of simple things. All idea is registered in the little particles heretofore referred to as light units. These units of light, heat, sex, electricity and magnetism are all male and all female. Every unit is either preponderantly male or preponderantly female. Just so is every unit either preponderantly electric or preponderantly magnetic. Just so is every unit either preponderantly negatively or preponderantly positively electromagnetic. Just so is every unit preponderantly generative or preponderantly radiative. And each unit is all of these. And each unit is variable, becoming preponderantly one or another of these in its turn, from the beginning to the end of its being and the variability is orderly, and governed by measurable laws of periodicity, which are also the laws by which motion is governed. It must not be forgotten that all that man calls creation is the result of motion, which is due to the opposing impulses of thinking. It must not be forgotten that the continuance of motion causes a creating and not a created universe. The electromagnetic action of the impulses of thinking is continuous in its opposing, and therefore are the effects of that opposition continuous. Opposing desire in sex expression is the cause of opposing motion. The cause cannot evade its effect. Opposing electromagnetic impulses are sex expression in creative thinking. Opposing electromagnetic impulses reproduce all effects of creative thinking. Form is born true to the rhythm of thinking. All thinking is rhythmic thinking. Idea is synchronous with the rhythm of thinking. All thinking is sex thinking. Creation is the transforming of the one substance by the rhythmic thinking of idea into apparent opposites and into that which man calls form. Beyond this, there is no more. Creation is but a concept of mind. It is but an illusion, an effect of thinking. All thinking is registered in light. All light is sex expression. Light is the language of all thinking. Light is the energy of all thinking. All energy is the energy of sex expression. There is no other energy. Through evolving sex, Light causes the transition of the universal substance into form. Through sex periodicity, light transforms form into variety of form. Chapter 9. Sex Opposites of Light Light is the power which God has used to create the appearance of form. Light is power for man to use in the perfection of his body. Therefore must he know the cause of light as he knows his alphabet. He must understand the inexhaustible source of energy which continues matter in motion, 
if he would know the fullness of energy available to his command. The rhythm of creative thinking is absolute. The registration of creative thinking is absolute. All thinking is creative thinking. All thinking is creating that which it is thinking. Man's power of thinking is in sex opposition of mind. God's power of expressing himself is in transforming that which is his own body into an effect which man calls creation. The universal one has no other means of expressing idea save through his own body. Man's power of expressing the idea of himself is only through his own body. Man has expressed himself through the creation of his own body by his own thinking, exactly as God has expressed himself through the creation of his own body by his own thinking. Man's body is but an individual effect of the whole of man and is the product of his thinking. The universe is the total of all individual effects and is the product of God's thinking. God's thinking is man's thinking. All thinking is the product of mind, and all mind is divine mind. Again, must it be written, there are not two minds, nor are there two kinds of minds in the universe. Light is God's medium of expressing himself. It is the only medium at his command. Light is man's medium of expressing himself. It is the only medium at his command. Creation of that which man calls form has a perpetual beginning and a perpetual ending. Its beginning is in thinking. Its end is in thinking. Its beginning is its ending. It has no beginning. It has no ending. There is no stop, no break in the continuity of thinking. To man its beginning is its appearance within his octaves of perception. To man its ending is its disappearance beyond his range of perception. Form is born of the desire to express idea. Form is the plaything of idea. All form is form of sex. Idea is never satisfied with form. Form of idea is continuously changing with the process of thinking. Form is born anew with each impulse of thinking. Idea is reasserted in new form with each impulse of thinking. All idea of mind is integrated through generative or male sex thinking. All idea of mind is disintegrated through radiative or female sex thinking. All idea of mind is reproduced through the regenerative union of sex thinking, which is equilibrium of sex. Idea of mind may mature or evolve only through sex union. Consider any idea of mind, whether that of individual man or of the universal one. Man thinks idea. Thinking is the force of motion. All motion is expressed in waves. All waves of motion are both male and female. All motion is oscillatory action and reaction. Action is male, reaction is female. All idea is registered in light as an appearance of the form of idea. Form of substance is electromagnetic. This means that it is preponderantly male and preponderantly female in periodicity. All idea evolves from idea into form of idea, which in turn evolves back again into idea. Evolution is growth. Devolution is dissolution. Evolution is male. It is electrically preponderant. Devolution is female. It is magnetically dominant. Man can only mature idea through the orderly periodicities of sex thinking. To evolve idea he must think in light. Genero active light is the creative force of sex thinking. Radioactive light is the decreative force of sex thinking. Union of these two opposites into the constant of one which is in equilibrium and has impact in inertia is the reproductive force. Sex is a dimension of illusion of form and as such it will be further considered with other dimensions of illusion which will be written down and charted. Chapter 10 the reproductive principle. Reproduction means the repetition of a state of motion. Reproduction is repetition. All phenomena of nature is repetitive. All states of motion are repetitive. All idea of mind is repetitive. Idea of mind is the product of thinking. Repetition of idea is the reproduction of that product. This is a universe of repetition of motion. This is a universe of reproduction. 
This universe of cause and effect is perpetual and continuous as to cause, and repeative as to all effects of cause. All effect is caused by thinking and registered in motion. All motion is either an action or reaction of its cause. Nothing is produced as an effect of thinking that is not either the action or reaction of force expressed in motion. That which is produced must be reproduced. No state of motion ever ends. All states of motion are forever reproduced. All states of motion are apparently separate things, are actions and reactions of the force which produce them. All varying idea of mind is registered in separate states of motion which have measurable dimensions. The reproduction of all idea is the result of union of the action and reaction which register that idea. Every action is male. Every reaction is female. Every action is electropositive. Every reaction is electronegative. Every action has its equal and opposite reaction. Every action and every reaction is a tone in an octave of the universal constant of energy. Equal and opposite actions and reactions, when united, comprise a unit of an octave of the universal constant of energy. An action and its opposite reaction are not two. Their energies, when combined, make one. Reaction is born of action, and action is born again of reaction. All idea and all forms of idea are the result of union between equal and unequal opposite actions and reactions of force. Perfection of mating lies in the union of exactly equal and opposite male actions and female reactions. In perfection of union lies stability. Imperfection of mating lies in the union of unequal and opposite male actions and female reactions. In imperfection of union lies instability. Unequal actions and reactions will unite with unwillingness which increases in proportion to their degree of departure from exact equality in opposition. When the potentials of the opposites are too far removed from equality, then will union cease. In organic life the union or reproduction of opposites is limited, and beyond the limitations reproduction is impossible. In the chemistry of inorganic life, the unstable union of unequal and opposite states of motion is also limited, and beyond the limitations union and reproduction is impossible. This is a universe of reproduction of idea in accumulated potential of the constant of energy, of registration of the soul of idea, in inertia, and of reproduction of accumulated potential. The idea of all things is produced by union of opposite actions and reactions under conditions favourable to union and is reproduced only under similar conditions. Reproduction is governed by the following laws. Unions of opposed actions and reactions are possible only within certain limitations. When union does not take place, there can be no reproduction. Equal and opposite actions and reactions, when united, are satisfied in their unions and will remain united. Stable unions will always reproduce true to species. Unequal and opposite actions and reactions, when united, are unsatisfied in their unions and will always seek their true tonal mates. Unsatisfied unions are unstable unions. Unstable unions never reproduce true to species. Unstable unions tend to return to their separate tonal states. If either mate in an unstable union finds a more equal mate, it will always leave the former and go to the latter. That which is true of chemical unions is true of all species of organic life. Every chemist knows to a certainty that he can break up any unstable compound formed by the union of unequal opposites by merely introducing an element which is more nearly a true tonal mate either of the united elements. Consider, for example, a chemical union between the male action sodium, Na, which is 601 of the 6th octave, with selenium, Se, which is 702 of the next octave, an unequally opposite female. The introduction of iodine, 
I, 801 of the 8th octave, will cause sodium to leave selenium and combine with iodine to form the more stable compound sodium iodide, NAL. Introduce bromide, Br, 701 of the 7th octave, and sodium will in turn leave iodine to form sodium bromide, NaBr, a still more stable compound. Finally, introduce chlorine, Cl, which is the true mate, 601, of the 6th octave, and sodium will leave bromine in order to form the very stable compound, sodium chloride, NaCl. No element of any octave whatsoever can displace chlorine from its union with sodium. Chemically, every element is both alkaline and acid but it is preponderantly one or the other. All male electropositive elements are preponderantly alkaline. All female elements are preponderantly acid. The alkaline male actions, when united with equal and opposite acid female reactions, are neutralised. They become salts. Alkaline male actions, united with unequal acid female reactions, accentuate the acidity or alkalinity. Hydrogen, united with its true mate, helionon, becomes a neutral salt. Hydrogen and fluorine will unite as an acid. Hydrogen and chlorine will unite as a stronger acid. All acids and alkalis increase in their strength as their resentment of unequal union increases. Likewise, the ability to reproduce decreases as the acidity or alkalinity of such unions increases. Chemical elements in union reproduce by the same process by which all other states of motion reproduce. Of this more will be written when further consideration of causes make the effects of these causes more comprehensible. All male actions are centripetal and all female reactions are centrifugal. Variance of centripetal or centrifugal force is variation of potential. Union and reproduction are always governed by sex periodicity in electromagnetic charge, the order of which will be written down and charted. Consider, for example, the reproduction of the sound of the human voice, echoing in the hills. Sound like all other forms of energy as an accumulated potential. Release this high potential and it immediately expands. Expansion is radiation. Radiation is discharge of accumulated potential. As the sound of the voice as accumulated potential radiates into the silence of higher octaves of lower potential and impacts against the closely integrated high potential of the cliffside, the degenerative discharge is reversed and becomes generative charge. Expanding lowering potential is reversed to contract in higher potential. In other words, the sex opposites in the radiating sound waves are forced into closer contact by the impact, so that the wave dimensions which originally produce the sound are restored. The counterpart of the sound as cause has been produced as the reproduced effect of that cause. It is not the same sound, it is another sound. It is a reproduced counterpart a regenerated reincarnation of the state of motion which had originally produced the sound. That which is true of regeneration by echo is also true of reproduction by radio or any other similar process. All are but the reversal of radiation into regeneration by impact against the inertial planes of higher potentials. Generation or regeneration is an effect of gravitation an impact of radiative energy against the lower octave of integration will set up the necessary resistance to the radiative energy to regenerate it into its original form. Chapter 11. Energy Transmission Some old misconcepts must now be corrected by a brief statement of principles, the full explanations of which will be given in their proper order that light travels, energy is transmitted, electricity is conducted or inducted, and that heat radiates from its source to other localities, are principles which modern science accepts as fundamental facts. 
These great misconcepts gave rise to the theory that the ether is a quivering elastic solid, existing in space along the undulating waves of which light, heat and all forms of energy can travel from one place to another. It is hereby conceded that all motion is expressed in waves, but those waves are not undulating. Energy cannot travel along waves because entire waves do not form in sequence. In other words, one whole wave is not completed before another begins. Waves are but effects which evolve as their cause evolves. Waves reproduce themselves part for part in sequence throughout the universe. Energy, therefore, cannot travel along waves which are not undulating, but are reproducing themselves part for part. It cannot leap across waves which are lacking in troughs and crests. Light does not travel, it reproduces itself. The light and heat which appear to come from the star or the sun has never left the star or the sun. That which man sees as light and feels as heat is the reproduced counterpart of the light and of the heat, which is its cause. The cause remains in the restricted area of the state of motion where it began, its existence as an appearance, until it expands into disappearance. That which man sees as a star is not a vision, a picture, an image or a reflection of the star. It is the exact reproduced chemical counterpart of the star, integrated as light within the observer. That which is true of the star is true of the image of the mountain, or the book, or the meadow violet. No idea of mind is seeing at a distance. The state of motion which represents the idea is reproduced as light by regenerative impact within the observer. No idea of mind has place or position in time or space. All idea is universal. All generated states of motion degenerate by expansion. Expanding states of motion regenerate by impact against the inertial planes of higher potential. Man has a higher potential than his surrounding atmosphere. Any object seen by man is a generated potential which is higher than the expanded potential which intervenes between the object and the observer. The higher potential of the object discharges into the lower surrounding potential as the reproduced expanded counterpart of its particular state of motion and recharges within the observer. This reproducing expanding counterpart impacts against the inertial plane of equal pressures which exists somewhere between the object and the observer. This impact causes a reversal of the process of reproduction of an expanding counterpart into reproduction of a contracting counterpart. The expansion of a state of motion is degeneration. The recontraction of expanding states of motion is regeneration. The law of reproducing idea is the principle of universality. All that is, is of everything else that is. The principle of reproduction is the principle of energy transmission. Energy transmission is conductive and inductive. Conduction is the lowering of high potential toward inertia. Induction is the raising of a low potential away from inertia. The electronegative dissipative reaction impulse of energy transmission is conduction. The electropositive generative action impulse of energy transmission is induction. Conductive energy resists the completion of the wave. Inductive energy ever leaps ahead in its eagerness to complete the wave. Conductive energy ever pulls toward inertia through the harmonic of the wave. Inductive energy ever pulls toward the overtones of the waves, which are the points of maximum opposition. A state of equilibrium is the state of inertia which exists where pressures of two opposing high potentials of accumulated energy are equalised. Form of idea is a state of potential, which is held together as form by the generoactive law of gravitation until it is torn apart by the radioactive law of radiation. All potential is constantly changing and interchanging. The potentials of all things are constantly rising because of their absorption of the discharged energy of all other states of motion. 
all mass is regenerated by absorption of the impacting radioactive energy of all other mass. Also are all potentials constantly lowering because of their expanded reproduction in the surrounding lower potentials. All mass is degenerated by its own radiation. All mass is generated by accumulation of the universal constant of energy into higher potential. That which is generated must be radiated. All mass is degenerated by release of energy accumulation. Consider, for example, the regeneration of this planet by the radiation of the sun's high potential of energy impacting against its surface. Modern science presumes that heat travels in some mysterious manner across the vast 90 million miles of space between the sun and the earth, crossing that space in which a temperature of nearly absolute zero prevails, and then arriving here hot. Man feels warmth from the sun, and in some manner it must be accounted for. The theory arrived at is far from the truth. Somewhere in the intervening low potential between the sun and the earth is the inertial plane, where the pressures of the potentials of the sun and earth are equalised. Against this inertial plane, the sun's cooling and expanding radiation impacts and reverses its expansion into contraction. The cooling, expanding, lowering potential reverses into heating, contracting, rising potential. By this impact, the expanding radioactive energy is reversed into contracting generoactive energy. By the impact of the sun's regenerated light emanations against this planet, all disintegrating matter is regenerated. Every living thing reverses its nightly intent to die and lives again. Flowers which have folded their petals reopen them and grow. Animal life which has closed its eyes in sleep becomes conscious once more and takes on new energy. The modern concept that solar energy is due to contraction is a misconcept. The energy given off from the sun is energy that is being generated within the sun. No energy can be radiated that has not been or is not being generated. All radiating mass is generating. All opposite effects of motion are simultaneous in their expression. The sun is preponderantly generative, it is heating. The sun is in a lesser degree radiative, it is cooling. As the sun heats, it radiates. Radiation disintegrates. As the sun cools, it generates. Generation integrates. Here follows the law of the cycle of appearance and disappearance of form. Cold generates. Generation contracts. Contraction integrates. Integration heats. Heat radiates. Radiation expands. Expansion disintegrates. Disintegration cools. Thus it may be seen that one opposite is always born of the other which in its turn becomes the cause of the first. Thus it may be seen that the disintegration of the preponderantly generating sun becomes the regeneration of this planet. The coefficient of cold for an expanded volume of mass of low pressure and potential becomes the coefficient of heat for the same mass in a contracted volume of higher pressure and higher potential. The totals of heat and potential have not changed. They have merely changed their dimensions nor has heat travelled. It has been reproduced. Magnetic flow in its magnetic orbit has been interrupted, that is all. The voice impacting against the cliff is an exact analogy. The voice regenerates into sound, and the positive charge of the cliff increases because of the impact. The heat from the sun has been disintegrated by radiation into the opposite of heat, which is cold. In radiation, however, the heat energy is not lost. Nothing can be lost. The energy which generated the heat is registered, together with the energy which radiated it, and an expanded counterpart of them both. No idea of mind, once begun, ever ends. No idea of mind ever began or ever ended. The Law in any wave, the induction current seeks the high pressures at the apex of its cone of energy, and the conductive current seeks the low pressures at its base. Chapter 12. This is a finite universe. Mind is all there is. 
it has no limitations as to shape, size or volume, for these qualities are but appearances and have no real existence. Mind is limited, however, in its power, its knowledge and its imagination, the last of which is, is its creative force. All of the effects of which mind is the cause are measurable in that they have the appearance of dimension. All dimension is limited, therefore must all cause be limited. Mind cannot create infinite complexity. Beyond the ten octave cycle of cause and its included effects, mind cannot go. All effects evolve to their limit and devolve back again into cause without any change whatsoever taking place in cause. The limitations of mind are absolute. A limited universe cannot be an infinite universe. This concept is extremely difficult for man to comprehend, for man has a fixed concept of a non-existent effect called space. This misconcept is born of his fixed idea of a universe separable into parts, all of which are related one to another in shape, size, volume, and the intervals of distance between them. To man, space and distance are fixed attributes of all his concepts and limit his comprehension. Man has built a misconcept of an infinite universe of infinite extension. Based upon his misconcept of space, he has reasoned that the universe cannot be finite or limited in extent, for if so, it must have shape or form. Also he has reasoned that in order for it to have shape or form and be limited and finite, there must be something beyond. The objective universe of man's concept demands a beyond to a finite universe. But there is no beyond, because there are no bounds nor boundaries in this formless universe. If space is non-existent, then extension or continuity is non-existent, and there can be no beyond. Beyond is a relative word. It is part of man's concept of objective reality. It is a dimension. It is based on a belief in the reality of the unrealities of dimension and separableness in a universe of the one thing. Man's sense of reasoning does not accept the idea of the universe as a finite volume such as a sphere, hanging in a vacuum, beyond which to his objective thinking there must be more empty space. For this reason he has formulated the belief that a finite universe is inconceivable to the human mind, therefore the universe must be infinite. Man's outer mind reasoning, which is objective, does not stop to consider that an infinite universe is more inconceivable to the human mind than a finite one. But that same reasoning is willing to accept the palpably incomprehensible and relegate it to the domain of divinity, which is admittedly incomprehensible, rather than concentrate the inner mind upon the higher octaves of thinking and learn the truth in light. Einstein rightly says that the universe is finite, but wrongly says that it has form. This great thinker declares his belief that the universe is spherical or elliptical. Einstein rightly says that any line of direction in that appearance which man calls space is curved and that it is presumable that any continuous line in space would curve ultimately back to its point of beginning. Therefore, the universe must be either spherical or quasi-spherical. This curving, however, is not because the one substance of mind has a finite form or shape, but because all effects of motion are universal, and every effect of motion is an action which must end where it began, in its final reaction. Direction, therefore, can never be in a straight line, but must always be curved. The reason why all lines must be curved lines and also why all curved lines must be spiral in their curvature, will be written down in all exactness in its proper place. It is true that any apparent disturbance in the substance of mind returns unto itself, unto its own exact apparent point of beginning in a sequence of reproduced waves, which spell out the appearance of another non-existent effect called time. Man's fixed concept of the reality of time is a drag anchor holding him away from truth. 
His fixed concept of intervals of time, in which one effect of motion in one part of the universe makes its appearance in another part, is the result of such purely objective thinking that true concepts cannot replace them, as long as this method of thinking persists. There are no parts of mind substance, no place and no position. Every part is the same part, every place and position, the same place and position. Thinking is universal, and all effects of thinking are universal. More than this, they are simultaneously universal, for thinking is simultaneously universal. Even a little child in tossing a ball affects the universe simultaneously with that tossing. All motion is simultaneously universal in this universe of equilibrium. Sequence is an appearance due to form. It has no existence in itself, and without form it would not have even the appearance of existence. All form is purely a question of gravitational intensity, and therefore has no existence. Time itself is an effect of gravitation, and has no existence. Like heat, it is but an indicator which registers sequence in integration, as heat registers resistance to integration. The reproductions and effects of motion, and their attendant unrealities, do not in any way change the universal substance of mind. The one reality, the one unchanging, indivisible ultimate substance of all that is. Add to the non-existent appearances, form, space and time, to others which obsess man's mind, position and dimension, and the relator can readily perceive that with those non-existent unrealities firmly fixed in his mind as existent realities, it would be impossible for man to accept the idea of a finite universe. To do so, he would have to imagine a form hanging like a ball in a void, to which there must be an empty inconceivable beyond. Man's outer mind is so accustomed to thinking reality into the unrealities of space, time, motion, form, position and dimension of an objective universe that it is hard for him to adjust his thinking to a subjective universe in which the unrealities disappear into the reality of light. Man's inner mind thinks in light, freed in its thinking form the illusions of outer mind thinking. Einstein's error is in attaching to the substance of mind the attributes which belong solely to dimension of the substance in its appearance as form. Chapter 13. A Dimensionless Universe Dimension is but an appearance, an effect of motion, and is non-existent. A mile between apparent objects is non-existent with the disappearance of the objects. Man's fixed concept of a universe of innumerable objects separated by relative and measurable distances unfits him for thinking of the universe in any but a relative sense. Man must think in light for true comprehension of mind. All men may think in the higher octaves of light when they but comprehend, but with comprehension comes power. To think in light is not a new power being evolved by man like a new sense. It is a power which is already in every atom of man's composition. Man thinks in the low octaves of his own integration, almost unaware that the higher octaves are within him, for the lower octaves are superimposed upon the higher. The higher octaves of incredibly higher speeds are within the lower octaves of high potential, but slow speed. Man may shift his thinking from the low speed of his outer mind to the higher speeds of his inner mind at will, even as he can shift the gears of his motor car. Man's thinking in his low octaves of bodily integration is like a man running his motor on low gear, ignorant of the fact that he has higher gears. Man's thinking in the higher octaves is like a man who is aware of higher gears in his car and knowingly uses them. Universal mind thinks in light, and registers that thinking in light which is integrated into the idea of thinking, and suspended for a time in the lower octaves of light in the appearance of form. Man's outer mind is an integration of light in the lower octaves of that which he calls matter, and man's outer mind thinks in the dimensions or illusions of mind or matter. Matter and mind and light and energy are the same. They are one, 
They are existent in that they never disappear. They are constant. They are eternal. Dimension of mind or light or matter or energy is but the illusion of the mind substance, due solely to more or less sustained motion. The substance which is mind or light or matter or energy, and is eternally existent as cause, must not be confused with its effects in motion, which are but dimensions, and therefore non-existent. Dimension is purely objective. Outer mind thinking is objective thinking. Objective thinking is thinking in dimension. The substance of matter is eternal, but its illusions of dimension in form are fleeting. Matter is frozen light, crystallized light of man's own lower octaves of thinking. So, even in outer mind thinking, man thinks in light, but it is meaningless to him. Man's inner mind is light, of the high octaves of inspirational ecstatic thinking. To man's inner vision, light is always light, it never disappears. Inner mind thinking is subjective thinking. Subjective thinking is dimensionless thinking. The inner mind of man knows no darkness. Light knows light, and all that is, is light. In the high speeds of inner thinking matter is dimensionless. The universe of mind is a dimensionless universe. The universe of the idea of mind is a universe of dimension. The creating universe is the idea of mind. It is the divine concept of a universe of motion and the apparent separability of the one thing into the appearance of many individual things. Chapter 14 Concerning Dimension the divine concept of a universe of form is the idea of the image-making faculty of mind. The divine concept is but an illusion of divine imagination. Mind thinks the ideas of mind into an illusion of form. Dimension appears when form appears. Form appears as a result of motion, generated by the concentrative impulse of thinking. Form disappears as a result of motion radiated by the deconcentrative alternate reactive impulse of thinking. Creation, therefore, is but an illusion due to complex states of motion. All motion is comprehensible. All motion is caused by thinking mind. All motion is controllable by mind. All comprehensible motion is measurable. Measures are dimensions. Dimensions are the intervals which define the relation of one illusion of form to another. Dimension disappears with the disappearance of the illusions it defines. All illusions of form are but varying states of motion, locked into the separate states of potential, which define those illusions. All states of motion are orderly and periodic. All states of motion, no matter how complex, are reducible to ten octaves of seven tones each plus their mid-tones and their master tones. All creation is reducible to about 140 elements, which tell the entire complex story of God's thinking, just as all literature is reducible to 26 letters, which tell the entire complex story of all of man's thinking. Neither have any existence beyond their ability of expressing, in form, the manifesting idea of creative mind. The elements of matter are all of the same substance, in varying states of motion. Gold is not one substance, and carbon another, and phosphorus still another. Gold differs from carbon, and silicon differs from copper, only by the relation of their intervals in motion, or the measurements of their separate dimensions, which, when agitated, constitute their separate states of motion. The divine concept is not a universe of motion, but of idea in form. Motion is necessary to produce the form of idea. It is but an attribute of thinking. It is not a principle. Man labours in the bowels of the earth for metals which he can create for himself with ease. When he fully comprehends the motion which has assembled the forms of those elements out of the idea of the divine concept, all that is in creation is fashioned into form of idea by the ten octave alphabets of thinking mind. Knowledge of the dimensions of each state of motion will give to man the power to produce from the most plentiful of them those which are most rare. 
that which nature has taken millions of years to produce through orderly interchange of potentials, man may produce in a few hours by forced interchange. There is no substance which nature can produce that man cannot also produce. When he knows the dimensions which measure the illusion of form of the substance, man has control of more energy than is necessary to transmute any one element or any compound into any other element or compound. All that he lacks is the knowledge of dimension in order that he may transmute that state of potential energy locked up in a state of motion called carbon into that other state of motion called gold. And he may have all that he desires at the cost of a very slight effort. The formula for measuring all dimensions of the various elements of matter will herein be written down and charted with all exactness so that man's burden of heavy labour may be lightened. Years will pass before civilization will have adjusted itself thoroughly to the changed conditions which this new knowledge will bring to the world, but from this change a new civilization will spring. These are the dimensions which, when known and measured, will make man master, in that he will be able to evolve or devolve or transmute or synthesize the elements at will. The first dimension is length the second breadth, the third thickness, the fourth duration or time, the fifth sex, the sixth pressures, the seventh potentials, the eighth temperature, the ninth ionization, the tenth crystallization, the eleventh valence, the twelfth axial rotation, the thirteenth orbital revolution, the fourteenth mass, the fifteenth color, the sixteenth plane, the seventeenth tone, the eighteenth ecliptic. These dimensions are characterized by one outstanding peculiarity common to all of them, an orderly periodicity. Beyond these eighteen dimensions and their inclusions, there are no more measurable intervals of motion. When all of these periodicities are charted, and their mathematical calculations computed with exactness, it will be very simple for the ingenuity of man to devise the mechanical apparatus necessary to decrease any high potential into any lower one, or increase any low potential into any higher one. Acceleration and deceleration are now measurable. Temperature, tone, colour, valence, ionisation, and those pressures which are known are now measured. Mass is measurable. Known orbits are now measured, and the unknown ones will be measured when they have been made known. The waves which constitute the complex of all elements have already been computed. The spectrum has been divided, and the elements are sorted into about 7,000 colour lines of light. But they are as meaningless to man as the Hebrew language is to the Gentile. These 7,000 lines of light are the letters of the universal language of light, the language in which God speaks to man. When man knows this language, he will then think in it. When he thinks in light, he will then know that he is the Son of God, and that he is one with God. When man thinks in light, he will then know that he is universal mind, that he is all that is, and that he is thinking mind, expressing his thinking in light, that he is omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. He will then know that he is life, and that life is eternal, and that there is no death, and that he has neither place nor position in space nor time, and that dimension is though it were not, and that there is but one, and that one he, and you, and me, and the rolling hills, and the sands of the sea, and the clouds, and the stars, and the little violet blooming in the meadow. Already man has gone a far way toward the solving of the great secret of this creating universe, which lies hidden in the elements. Within God's alphabet of light, the locked secret has long awaited the master key of knowledge to open the doors to man. Man is mind. Mind creates and controls the energies of the elements. Mind may rearrange these energies and combine them in accord with its desire. Chapter 15 The Formula of the Locked Potentials Now must be constructed the cosmic clock by means of which all dimensions may be measured by one formula, as time is measured by the formula of hours, minutes and seconds. 
Heretofore it has been written down that periodicity is an absolute characteristic of all effects of motion. With two exceptions, all dimensions of all effects of motion are of the same orderly octave periodicity. These two exceptions are of cyclic periodicity. Octave periodicity is an orderly progression to and from the maximum effect of each octave. Cyclic periodicity is an orderly progression to and from the maximum effect of the entire cycle. Thus may it now be simply stated that all periodicities of all motion, of whatever nature, with two exceptions, may be built upon the following extremely simple formula. The two exceptions to this octave periodicity are mass and tone. Mass means weight, tone means sound. Mass accumulates all down the entire ten octaves. Tone lowers from the highest note down the cosmic keyboard to the lowest. The zero represents inertial energy, and the numerals represent the orderly progression in lock potentials and pressures and orbits. Thinking mind has devised these orderly progressions as its method of evolving the idea of universal thinking into the appearance of form, and evolving it into the disappearance of form. The numerals of this formula are the hours of the cosmic clock. They are in the relative positions of the atoms of the elements, and in the order of their respective varying dimensions. The seconds of the cosmic clock are the corpuscles, or light units, which make up the atom structures. The hands of the clock are the indicating line of charging and discharging potential. The mainspring is the ten-octave cycle. Five of these octaves are decelerating time dimension transformed by accumulation into power, and the other five octaves are power dimension released into accelerating time. The winding of the clock is the sublime five octave inhalation, and its unwinding is its five octave exhalation. The cosmic pendulum in its swinging ticks off the varying dimensions of all motion forever and forever, with unfailing accuracy, but never does it depart from this simple formula. One by one the relator will take up and analyse the eighteen dimensions of the effects of motion. Neither temperature nor valence nor orbit nor colour, nor ionisation nor electric force, nor magnetic force, nor any effect of chemistry known to man or still to become known, None of these, nor others herein unnamed, except in mass and tone, can extend beyond this simple formula. It is meet that this simple formula of vast import should have a name, so that it may be referred to in proper terminology. The formula of lock potentials shall be the name by which this formula shall be hereafter known. Energy accumulates during Gennaro active inhalation by rising potential and is dissipated during the radioactive exhalation by lowering potential. The periodicities of inhalation and exhalation in all mass are absolute. Chapter 16. Universal Oneness Now must be the simplest, but the greatest of all laws of the universe written down. Everything that is, is of everything else that is. Nothing is of itself alone. All created things are indissolubly united. This is the law of the entire substance of divine mind. This is the law of the souls of things. This is the law of love. It is the law of the oneness of the universe. All that is, is one. There are not two independently separate things in the entire universe. Individuality is non-existent. Individuality is but an appearance of separability and divisibility in a universe which is non-separable and non-divisible. No one can say, I alone am I. If one should say, I am I, he must say also to all men and all created things, I am thou, and thou art also I. The oneness of the universe is the sublimely simple one spiritual substance of divine mind. The one substance of mind is a living substance, of the one living thinking being, of which all things in this universe are a part, and to which they are indissolubly 
united. Light is that which makes the one substance a living substance. Light is the life principle of mind. Light is the creating force of the universe. Light is all that is. Light is the living God. God is manifested in light. Light is the Holy Spirit. God, Father, Mother, Nature, Man, the Oak, the rolling hills and mountain chains, the pounding sea and the sands of the sea, the babbling brook, the red apple hanging on the tree, the autumn haze, the storm, the stars in the heavens, the blade of grass and the kindly dew in the opening rose. All creating things are dependent upon light to hold them together in the appearance of individually separate things. As light is the substance of all things, and all things are dependent on light, all things are therefore interdependent. All are continuously interchanging by reproduction throughout the universe in continuity. No one created thing has time nor place nor position in idea. The idea of all creating things is universal. It is omnipresent as idea throughout the entirety of mind, but the counterpart of idea in all created things is sequential in time and place. The counterpart of idea is the reproduced idea. The reproduced idea is a part of the basic idea. This is a universe of reproduction. Production and reproduction of idea of thinking mind is the sole result of thinking and the sole reason for thinking. Idea and reproduction of idea are universal in sequence as states of motion are universal in sequence. Idea and reproduction of idea are multiplied as appearances in motion in opposition, of which the pulsations of thinking mind are the cause. There is no other cause, there is no other motion. Each idea and each reproduced counterpart of idea has but the appearance of time and place and position, from which it does not appear to depart. Still is it of all the universe apart. The rose blooming in my garden is of Arcturus apart, as it is of you and me. The universe sways to the swaying of the rose in my garden. Every particle of matter in this universe has its own magnetic pole, through which it is connected with the magnetic pole of each other particle of matter in the universe, and through which each particle is affected by the ever-changing condition of every other particle in the universe. This is a universe of equilibrium in motion, the continuity of which could not be maintained except through the interdependence of all apparently separated units. Everything that is, is of everything else that is. Nothing is of itself alone. All created things are indissolubly united. All is God and God is all. God is light, light is all. Creation is the sublime idea of the sublime being. The sublime is always simple. With creation, simplicity seems to end and complexity to begin. Complexity begins to creating things. Man's outer mind is a heavy and complex mind. It knows not the sublimity of simplicity. The inner mind of man is attuned to the ecstatic meter of divine thinking. The inner mind of man knows the sublimity of deific simplicity. The inner mind of man knows light. Everything that is, is of everything else that is. Nothing is of itself alone. The perfume of the rose is part of the rose, and it is also part of man, and of the winds, and of the garden wall. The perfume of the rose is light, as the rose is light, and so also is man, and the winds, and the garden wall. All that is, is light. Nothing is of itself alone. He who knows this greatest of all laws knows love. Love is the realisation of the oneness of the universe. Love is the ecstasy of inspired thinking. God's thinking is ecstatic thinking. God is love. Until man knows this from within his inner mind, this law of the oneness of all things, it has no meaning for him. When man knows this law in his heart, he will have no limitations. When man knows this law, so that its reaction within the soul of man is that of ecstatic inspired contemplation, he will then begin to know the meaning of love. Unlimited power will then be his. 
His thinking will then be true thinking. All power is in true thinking. Thinking true may be likened unto a violin string sounded by the great master. Ten thousand other strings tuned to the same pitch would sing in unison unplayed upon. Ten thousand other strings not so attuned would not know the ecstasy. They would be as though they were not. Inspired thinking is thinking in tune with divinity. Inspired thinking is thinking in exact pitch with the high octaves of divine thinking. The rhythm of light in the high octaves of light is the measure of true pitch and true thinking. True thinking of the inner mind makes true thinking of the outer mind. The outer mind thinks not in ecstatic measure. As a man thinks in his inner mind, so is he. The inner mind within all men and within all things is divine mind. The inner mind of man is tuned to the higher speeds of ecstatic thinking. Man may know the ecstasy of his own divine thinking. If he will but tune his thinking to the high speeds of ecstatic metre of divine mind, which is within all men and all things. When man will so attune his thinking, then will he think in light. The inner mind of man alone can think in light. Inner thinking is ecstatic thinking. The outer mind of man cannot know light. The outer mind cannot know ecstasy. When man thinks in light, he will then know the perfection of divine idea. He will be universal genius. Imperfection of idea cannot exist. The entire idea of thinking mind is good. There is no evil. There is no imperfection. That which man calls the created universe is the idea of thinking mind. The idea of mind is perfect, as mind in itself is perfect. Perfection of idea is truth. Imperfection of idea is electromagnetically impossible in this universe of equilibrium, as we shall see in later chapters of this book. Thinking true in light will give to man all power. He will have no limitations except those that are universal. With his feet on the electrodes of the universe and his eyes in the high heavens, impossibilities of yesterday will be simple achievements of today. With this knowledge from within, man can have dominion over all nature and all things. Man can have dominion over his own body and command it to health and to beauty and to comeliness. With the realisation of this law in his heart, he will love and be loved of all men and all creating things. And he will know all things. All knowledge will come to man when he knows this law in his heart. All knowledge exists. Thinking man has all knowledge. Inspired man knows the law of love in his heart with the oneness of the universe. All knowledge is existent in the universe and is the inheritance of thinking man from divine mind. God and Father of man, and of all creating things. This inheritance of all knowing awaits every man to use, as and when he desires that knowledge. Chapter 17. Omnipresence Man's concept of God as omnipresent, or universally present, is an inconsistent concept, for it does not include man or nature in that concept as God, or as part of God. Man has been so trained to look for God outside the realms of nature, as an incomprehensible, substanceless God, separate and apart from himself, and from that which he knows as the physical universe, that it has become a tradition of his thinking, a fixed habit of his thinking. It may be a shock, therefore, to the outer mind of man, to find a comprehensible God, of which he himself and all phenomena of nature are one. If this discovery shocks man's earthbound mind, then he must learn to readjust his thinking. For there is no other God than mind. And there is no other mind than the one universal mind. Nor is there any other purpose for mind than the purpose of thinking. Man cannot conceive any other purpose for mind than that of thinking. Nor is there any other product of thinking than idea. Creation is but an idea of thinking mind. The divine concept, materialised into this universe of matter, is a stupendous idea of mind, but it varies not one bit in principle from the simplest idea of man, nor does it vary in universal mechanics from the dynamic principles employed by man 
for the materialization of his ideas. God is mind, man is mind. All idea of God or man is but the product of thinking mind, registered in matter as form of idea. All idea is an illusion of mind, and visible only to mind as an illusion. Idea is held in form by mind for countless periodic intervals of evolution and dissolution. All thinking is universal thinking, immortal thinking. There is no mortal thinking. All idea of mind is perfect. Imperfection of mind cannot exist. Separation of mind into parts is impossible. Therefore there are not two minds or two substances. The one substance of mind is light. Light is universal. Man is light and man is universal. That which is universal is omnipresent. Man is therefore omnipresent. All matter is omnipresent. The universe has no extension, continuity, space nor time. The oneness of the universe allows no exceptions, no mistakes, no error in its all-inclusiveness. Nothing is omitted from the entirety of mind. There are no separable parts of mind. No apparent part of mind has locality or position. All matter is universally present. All matter is light. Mind is light. Mind is the universe. Mind is all. One. Chapter 18. Omnipotence. Omnipotence means all the power that exists. The omnipotence of the universe is limited in its expression by the limited power of the universal constant of energy to accumulate potential. The dynamic energy born of the action and reaction of universal thinking is the beginning of the activity of that which man calls electricity and magnetism, through which the universal constant of energy functions in the creation of separate appearances in matter by periodic changes of dimension. It is the beginning of apparent division or indivisible things into their apparent opposites. It is the beginning of sex. Sex begins when the opposites of light begin. It is the beginning of that which man knows as light and of the colours of light. It is the beginning of life. Life begins when light begins. It is the beginning of sound. Sound begins when light begins. It is the beginning of the generative concentration of light into that state which man calls heat, and its radiation into that which man calls cold. It is the beginning of integration and disintegration of light energy into the appearance and disappearance of that which man calls matter. It is the beginning of the crystallization of light units into that which man calls solids of matter. It is the beginning of integration and disintegration of light energy into the appearance and disappearance of that which man calls mass. It is the beginning of the electromagnetic opposition of the two forces which accumulate and dissipate the universal constant of energy into the periodicities of gravitation, attraction, cohesion, radiation and repulsion of evolving and devolving mass. It is the beginning of the appearance of form. It is the beginning of the combination of form into the appearance of elements of matter and of compounds of matter into that which man calls growth. It is the beginning of apparent transformation of the infinitely simple into the infinitely complex. It is the beginning of the interrelationship of matter which man calls the chemistry of matter. It is the beginning of force and the motion of force and the inertia of motion. It is the beginning of time. Time begins with the impulses of universal thinking. It is the beginning of that universal rhythmic swing of the cosmic pendulum toward the apparent intent of unequilibrium, which is the cause of all creating things. It is the beginning of the illusion of separateness into the appearance of many things. There are no separate things. There is but the one thing. Nothing is of itself alone. It is the beginning of the souls of creating things and of the expression in matter of that which man calls life. The whole of creation is contained in the desire of universal mind to express idea, form and rhythm. In accord with immutable law, in endless sequence through endless ages. Beyond this there is no more. All mind is universal and all mind has all power. The mind of man is universal mind. 
man has all power all power is universally present throughout the entirety of this dimensionless universe all matter and all creating things are the images of thinking mind thinking mind is light and light is universal that which is universal is not separable from itself omnipotence is therefore universal even to the last corpuscle of the most insignificant atom all matter is omnipotent the universe of matter is breathing its energy in tune with the one breathing pulsing living being call it what you will whether it be god or mind or the universal one the in-breathing out-breathing impulse of the living thinking god mind is in absolute equilibrium throughout the universe they are also simultaneous but alternately preponderant exhalation proceeds in a lesser degree during inhalation and inhalation continues but in a lesser degree when exhalation is in preponderance also all motion is simultaneous in its opposition the opposing motions are merely alternately preponderant all motion is oscillatory because of this sequence of preponderance in its opposition of which much will be written in its proper place no atom no man nor creating thing can or power from the universal one or increase or decrease it or be independent of it whole or in part all power is the thinking power of mind all the universe is mind and all the universe is thinking in unison mind is that universal one thing which man calls god mind is the universe mind is all one chapter nineteen omniscience within the thinking substance of universal mind is all knowledge the entire substance of mind is knowledge knowledge is universal man's concept of all knowledge and all intelligence is a wrong concept to man knowledge is quantitatively limitless and infinitely complex man conceives the boundaries of knowledge and intelligence to be far beyond his comprehension this is not a true concept the knowledge and intelligence of universal mind is limited and simple knowledge is perception of dimensionless existence nothing more knowledge is an attribute of substance it belongs to existence and the reality of existence knowledge might be likened unto the alphabet within the alphabet is all knowledge but as until it is put into words and phrases the alphabet is devoid of idea intelligence is an understanding of the reality of existence as it is registered in the illusion of existence intelligence belongs to motion and not to substance it belongs to the appearance of existence and to the unreality of the illusions of existence knowledge is passive inert it belongs to the equilibrium of unchanging causes intelligence might be likened unto the putting together of the alphabet of knowledge into words and phrases of infinite variety of idea if the universal one had not a creative thinking mind he would possess all knowledge but would be without intelligence intelligence is the act of thinking creatively or in other words the act of putting together the illusions of idea into the forms of those illusions intelligence is active opposing it belongs to the opposed motion of changing effects changing effects cannot be known they can only be comprehended all knowledge of the illusion of existence is limited to perception of causes of that illusion causes are unchanging causes are existent knowledge is limited to that which is existent effects are non-existent they but appear to exist they are but idea in transit all idea is transitory the idea of thinking mind is always in motion and therefore constantly changing solids are as changing as the sunset sky the difference of motion is but relative therefore man cannot acquire knowledge from changing effects he can but acquire a comprehension of its complexities man can have no knowledge of the sunset sky for it is but an effect man can have knowledge of the cause of the sunset sky and its effects he can comprehend 
Knowledge is simple as cause is simple. Comprehension may be ever so complex. That which man calls knowledge is based upon observed causes and effects of complex facts of matter. There are no unconditioned facts of matter in a universe of motion. There are but appearances of facts. Man conceives that all our knowledge must ultimately repose on conditions which are unproved and unprovable. Facts of form in matter are unprovable in a world of space, time and motion. Matter as form in motion is but an ever-changing effect of an unchanging substance. Effects of matter are manifested in form. Effects are fleeting, they are ever-changing. Form is fleeting, it is ever-changing. Effects of causes are facts only in appearance. Appearances of this moment are not the same the next moment. The facts of appearances disprove themselves in the proving. All facts of form in matter are as the sunset sky. They are but fleeting effects. Causes of the appearance of existence are the only unconditioned facts. In a universe of motion, things are not what they seem and there is nothing permanent but change. All form is constantly in transit between appearance and disappearance. Transition is not existence. It is but an effect of motion upon a substance which alone is existent. The ripples on the water are an effect upon the substance of water. They have no existence in themselves. Without the substance of water they could not have appeared. Having appeared as an idea of ripples, they will disappear into the substance of water. That which periodically appears in transit throughout the ten-octave range of idea will also periodically disappear. That which appears must disappear, but also must it reappear in accordance with the immutable law that no state of motion ever ends. The divine concept is eternally repeated in the reproduction of idea into form and is dissolution back again into the memory of form. All idea is periodic in its repetitiveness of form, and of the memory of form. The divine concept, in its entirety, is the stupendous but comprehensible effect of a very simple cause. All effects of this creating universe can be comprehended when all causes are known. The limitations of all thinking are within the laws of motion, and the effects of motion. Man can conceive nothing beyond the effects of motion and its cause. No phenomena of matter can be new phenomena of matter. Nothing is or will be which has not always been. All phenomena of matter have finite limitations. All complexities of matter are but effects of light in its orderly and limited variance of motion. The forms or images of idea are limited even in their variability and complexity to the limitations of the ten octave range of thinking. Omniscience does not mean unlimited knowledge. It means all the knowledge that there is. Complexity of idea does not constitute new knowledge. Quantity and complexity of fleeting effects of unknown causes do not add to knowledge or to intelligence. Knowledge cannot be added to or subtracted from. Knowledge cannot transcend knowledge. Mere possession of knowledge or storing of idea is not indicative of intelligence. A man may be an encyclopedia of knowledge, but still lack the dynamic intelligence necessary in order to use it by giving it expression as idea. The acquisition of knowledge by man may be likened unto the counting of grains of sand, a lifetime of futile counting, and the beach is still uncounted, while ten times ten million beaches await his useless counting. Men's lives are spent in forever counting unnumbered grains of sand. Men's lives are spent in studying complex and comprehensible effects of unknown causes. A study of the stars is more ponderous than the counting of grains of sand, but it is of no more import. Knowledge invites conception of idea in infinite variety, the complexities of which are apparently existent, through the act of thinking. It is as though the alphabet desired its letters, arranged in infinite variety of idea. The attribute of desire in knowledge is the cause of the dynamic activity of intelligence. Complexity of idea in forms of matter is only an appearance registered in low octaves of accumulated high octaves. 
To man, an appearance is that which comes within the range of his perception. When an appearance disappears, it has only gone beyond his range of perception. Appearance within the range of man's perception does not mean no existence. Disappearance beyond the range of man's perception does not mean cessation of existence. The cloud which disappears beyond the hill does not cease to be a cloud because of its disappearance. Vapour which disappears from man's sense of vision does not cease to be water. It can again reappear to the vision of man as water. Light which disappears into an octave, higher than that which man can perceive it, does not cease to be existent as light. The thinking of mind is within the limitations of the knowledge of mind. The thinking of mind is limited to the cognizance of universal being. The limitations of knowledge are within knowledge itself. Beyond the existence of mind there is no more. Mechanics and mathematics, ideals and ideas, science and art, solids of matter and the effects of motion are all complex effects of perfect thinking. That which man calls spirit is not extraneous to matter. Matter and spirit are one. Spirit could not create a new substance extraneous to itself. One substance cannot become another substance. Mind is the only existent substance. Nothing is existent that is not spiritual. As existence is limited to thinking, and thinking is limited to ten octaves, man's concept of an infinite spiritual existence is a mistaken one. Mind being all that exists, is limited to its own ten octave range of thinking, and is also confined to the act of thinking. It has no other purpose nor any other possible activity. That which is limited cannot be infinite, but it can be eternal. Spiritual existence is finite. It is a limited but eternal existence. If divine mind were an infinite mind, it could not be comprehensible to man. But its simple limitations make it easily comprehensible. If thinking is the cause of all effect and thinking is limited in range, then are the effects of that cause limited in range? Heat is an effect of thinking which has its limitations. Motion, volume, weight, mass, sex, sound, colour, form. All these are effects which have their limitations. These effects are comprehensible. Comprehension is therefore limited to the range of possible effect. All intelligence does not therefore mean unlimited comprehension. It means all the intelligence that there is. Finite limitations in the expression of mind in idea might be likened unto the limitation of the painter to the colours on his palette. The painter has infinite variation within the colour range of his palette, in the expression of idea of the image-making faculty of his mind. Within these limitations his complexities of variation are without end, but beyond them he cannot go, he is limited by his colour range. The colour spectrum is his palette, and it has its limitations. The master painter is thus limited by the range of his spectrum, but within these definite limitations. He has infinite possibilities for expression of the ideas of the image-making faculty of his thinking mind. Limitations which are definite cannot be infinite. Divine existence is contained within the limitations of the range of divine thinking. Beyond this range, divine mind cannot perceive or think. The illusions or appearances which man mistakes as existence are but reappearances of old illusions. Reappearance is repeatedness. The orderliness of created things is due to the invariability of cyclic periodicity in all effects of thinking. The pitch and tone and measure and meter of true thinking is due to the absolute rhythm of the repeating periodicities of thinking. The very dependability of universal mind, reflected in nature's inexorable laws, is due to universal limitations. God has set his own immutable laws in orderly repeating periodicities of thinking. He himself is limited by them. He himself is bound to the observance of them. God cannot, never has, and never shall change his own immutable laws. Upon this fact is based the very dependability of the universe. 
Man's belief that God set aside his own laws to perform miracles is the primitive concept of superstitious man. Superstition belongs to primitive man, who is but learning how to think from within. When primitive man first catches gleams of the divinity within him, he is then rising above the thinking of the animal which he has been. Upon these faint gleams he builds his primitive concepts, based on fear of that which is superior to himself. To primitive man, modern man owes his concepts of a cruel god of supernatural power. These wrong concepts have been traditions of man's mind and habits of his thinking. A modern man inherits the habits of the unbalanced thinking of primitive man. Orderly thinking is perfect equilibrium. Against perfect equilibrium, nothing imperfect can prevail. Variation of the measure of true thinking would throw the rhythm of orderly thinking out of tune, and the universe could not be. To think in light is to think only perfection, for perfection is all that is written there. Mind is perfect, there is no evil. Imperfection or evil is non-existent. Man's concept of evil is a wrong concept. Evil is as impossible as unequilibrium is impossible. The reader will remember that all thinking is an oscillation between two equal and opposite actions and reactions. He will remember that the union of any two exactly equal and opposite actions and reactions make one. Man has control over his actions, but he has no control over the reactions of those actions. The appearance of evil is merely potential out of place and suspended there for the time. Like the apple on the tree, gravitation will eventually restore it to its proper place in equalised potential. From this inevitable return to the stability of conquering truth, there is no escape. The apple, as accumulated potential suspended out of place, will seek its own potential by falling toward higher pressures, when the stem weakens by disintegration. Again the decaying apple, disintegrating into gases of lower potential, will seek the place of lower potential by rising into lower pressures. Just so with evil. It is but an action which must eventually meet its reaction. The action which man calls wrong thinking is simultaneously written on the soul as positive charge and is balanced by its opposite and equal negative reaction. Thus the equilibrium of the universe remains constant and man has recorded his own thinking which he may correct at will, on his soul, but correct it he must. Concerning the soul Man is ever concerned regarding his soul and its habitation after death. Man need have no concern. Man's soul is but the memory of the evolving idea of man. Out of the soul the body is again born. The soul is but the record of man's thinking. The evolving idea of man cannot forever be held in suspense in inertia. The soul of a dead man is but the record of a man asleep for a while, awaiting the renewal of his body. The first part of sleep is but a centrifugal decentrative reaction to a centripetal concentrative period of action. It is the expanding dissipative non-creative impulse of thinking, just as wakefulness is the contracting generative creative impulse. It is the period of preponderantly exothermal electronegative discharge when the body degenerates in preponderance to its generation. Later during sleep, the centripetal concentrative action begins to accumulate until it becomes sufficiently preponderant to cause the state of what is known as wakefulness. In the same way, during the first part of the day, the contracting generative impulse is in preponderance, but later fatigue shows that the expanding non-creative impulse of thinking is increasing until, in turn, becomes predominant and causes another period of sleep, and so the pendulum swings. As in all other phenomena of motion, sleep and wakefulness are simultaneous in their expression of their opposition, but preponderantly one or the other in sequence. Just so with life and death. From the moment of birth we begin to die. Generation of that which man knows as life merely predominates, until that which he knows as death takes its turn in orderly sequence. Death is just a longer sleep than the daily sleep, 
the difference is the duration of the sleep concerning reincarnation death is a life period of sleep for total bodily regeneration just as the daily sleep is for partial bodily regeneration regeneration of the soul is reincarnation of the body the chemistry of the soul of all idea is registered in the master tones known as the inert gases the soul is the matrix of the body just as the master tones are the matrices of the elements the inert master tones of the octaves of the elements contains a complete exact record of every effect of motion within its octave the soul of man contains a complete and exact record of every action and reaction of thinking man the moving finger writes and having writ moves on nor all thy piety nor wit shall lure it back to cancel half a line nor all thy tears wash out a word of it creation is just a swing of the cosmic pendulum between sleep and sleep between awakening and awakening and one follows the other as night follows the day and the day again follows the night while sleeping for a night man does not cease to be nor does he fear to sleep for he knows that sleep is beautiful and he will awaken at the dawn of a new day man fears to die for he knows not what the dark sleep of death will bring he knows not that death is but a longer and more beautiful sleep from which he will awaken with a newly regenerated body to begin once more his periodicity of growth at the dawn of another new day of life man fears the hobgoblins of primitive man's concept of punishment of the soul for the sins of the body he fears the dark sleep of death with its terrors much as the child which has been frightened by ghost stories fears the dark with its same imaginary terrors with new comprehension man can eliminate the imaginary hobgoblins and fears from his declining years and go to sleep with his disappearance of form in peace in disappearance man does not cease to be in his disappearing the idea of man does not discontinue as the day disappears only to reappear in its proper periodic interval so must man reappear all appearances and disappearances are periodic also are all reappearances periodic appearances and disappearances are but moving points in the cycle of mind in this universe of motion creating things do not pause at any point there are no created things there are but creating things ever integrating ever moving ever evolving in the integration and the assembling of the idea of themselves no form of life has ever been created it is creating nothing has been all things are being evolving idea into form is a positive action requiring the creative intelligence of imagination a man who only has great knowledge has a negative possession poor he is indeed a man who has great imagination has a positive dynamic possession rich is he for knowledge is within him and of a certainty he shall find it knowledge of existence is not acquired from without it is recollected from within when man learns new things he is but recollecting old experiences of his thinking thought by him before in higher octaves man is not deceived about the elusive non-permanent quality of the evolving ideas of his own thinking he knows that they will soon pass and that he cannot hold their evolving forms in suspension unchanging for one instant the relative scale of man's objective universe deceives him as to the illusion of his evolving idea the universal mind thinks idea into form exactly as man thinks idea into form the universal one cannot hold the evolving form of divine idea in suspension any more than man can there is but one process of thinking for there is but one mind there are not two minds nor two methods of thinking nor are there two sets of laws governing thinking nor are there two separate substances nor two separate things nor two separate beings in the universe all thinking is universal thinking all thinking things are thinking in unison all are creating that which they are thinking all thinking things are self-creating all thinking things are creating all things man is his own creator 
Man is the creator of all that is. This shall man know when he shall think within, in the higher octaves of light of his inner mind, when man shall know the language of the Universal One, of whom he is a part, then shall he know the voice of the Universal One. The still small voice within Universal Man speaks to him in the language of light, in words of tones in the speed of light. Within the heart of thinking man, the silent voice has forever asked, Who am I? Since the beginning man cried aloud, Who am I? And the voice answered, Thou art I, I the Universal One, am thou whom thou art creating in my image. The voice within man insatiable asks forever, Who am I? And the still small voice answers, I am I, I am I whom I am creating. I am the universal I. I am all that is and thee. I am he that is one with me. I am the empire of that I am. Since the beginning the voice within man asks, Whence came I? And the voice forever answers, I am of the universal passion of creation. I came from God. I am of God. I am sole record of idea. Where God is, I am. Where I am, there God is. Within man the voice of long ages demands, What am I? And the familiar voice answers, I am of the body of God, born of his substance. God is mind, I am mind. God is truth, I am truth. God is love, I am love. God is life, I am life. God is light, I am light. God is power, I am power. What God is, I am. What he commands, I command. My purpose is his purpose. God lives in me. My inheritance is from God and of God. He gives all to me. He withholds nothing. The divinity of me is thine and mine. It is that which is recorded within the soul of me. It is the Holy Spirit within the sanctuary of me. I am an idea of thine. The body of me is the idea of the soul of me. It is mine and thine. I am the master sculptor. My body is the plastic clay. My soul is the mother mould of my body, the matrix for my regeneration. I am what I am. I shall be what I desire to be, what I am I have desired to be. I am the sum of my own desire. I am thou creator of myself. Thou art I creator of all. I am thou creator of all. For thou hast made it known in my heart that I am not of myself alone. I am thou, and thou art I. I am the fathermost star, and of the blade of grass of my dooryard. I am of my brother, and of the mountain. The ecstasy of my thinking varies the spectra of ten times ten billion stars, and illumines the ether of endless space. Thy thinking has created all that is. My thinking is thy thinking. My thinking has created all that is. I am ecstatic man. I am man self-creating. I am God, creator of man. I am father of myself. I am son of the living God. The ends of space are mine. I shall know no limitations that are not thy limitations. Within man the still small voice asks from the beginning and ceaselessly, Why am I? And the voice answers, I am an expression of the universal passion of creation. God created me that I should fulfil his purpose. God gave me desire to create, and the power of creation. God dwells within me. I shall not deny the power within me, which is God within me. I shall not close the ears of my soul to the whisperings of my soul, which makes me dwell on the mountain top in ecstasy of inner thinking. The universal desire is expression of idea through the rhythm of thinking, in accord with the law, in endless sequence throughout endless space. Within man the ever-questioning universal voice beseeches, Whither am I bound? And the voice answers, God was my beginning, is my substance, and shall be my end. From the one I came, to the one I return. I but tarry by the way to do the will of the one. I am universal man, the image of my creator. Ecstasy and exaltation attend me, for I know that all that is, is within me. My dwelling place is in the high heavens on the mountain top, above the waters and the earth. I range the high heavens in ecstasy. 
My feet are winds, the ends of space are mine. I sing praises unto all the universe, by the way. The hosts of heaven rejoice with me, by the way. I have denied my unity, my universality I have not known. My dwelling place was the earth. I walked the earth heavily in chains. My earth-bound feet dragged heavily after me. I wearied of the long road. My back bent with the ache of its burden. I was lonely and the way dark. I shall not deny my oneness and live in the loneliness of the dark. I shall know my universality and I shall dwell on the mountain top. In the light of inner thinking, hope dwells in the light. Despair lurks in the dark. Life and growth are of the light. Death and destruction are of the dark. Memory. The acquisition of new knowledge by man is but the rethinking or recollection of old knowledge. Learning is not acquisition. It is recognition of the truth through the act of recollection. Recollection is the act of transforming the potential energy of an idea stored in memory, in inertia, into the kinetic energy of active mind, which is the state of concentrative thinking. Recollection is a dynamic concentrative action of mind. It is therefore electropositive and belongs to motion in opposition. It is the action of again giving form to the memory of idea. Recollection differs from creation in this wise. The act of creating idea into form by concentrative thinking is an initial action. The act of recollection is the regeneration or reproduction of that initial action, the reaction of which has been stored in memory. It is the resurrection of the soul of idea into the body of it. It is the recreation of idea into form for its further evolution. Memory is the storehouse of the idea of mind. Thinking mind taps that storehouse of memory in that activity of mind which man calls by many names such as memory, instinct, intuition and imagination. They are all one and the same. Their varying shades of meaning indicate only the differing manner in which old recollections of memory, recorded in millions of years of evolving ideas, manifest themselves. If man could but see that the thinking of all mind is the same, whether it be mind of God or mind of man, or bird or beaver or oak or rose, he would have a truer concept of the universe. If he could see that there is but one mind, and that mind is thinking in the expression of but one idea, then he would begin to comprehend the divine conception. If he could but see that the one idea is the whole creating, evolving universe, the one great illusion of divine mind, as a passing fancy is an illusion of man's mind, he would be getting closer to the fundamental truth. Then if he could but see that the illusions of the one idea is but illusion of form, the substance of which is mind, he would not then look to illusions as dependable realities and to the one reality as undependable illusion. If he could go farther in his comprehension and realise that God and man and the oak and the atom are just one and that all these are thinking out the divine idea, then would he be close to the door of the Holy of Holies. Perhaps it might assist thinking man toward the attainment of his concept of comparing the thinking human brain as an appearance to the thinking mind of the universe as an appearance. To man the appearance of the universe is that of countless objects at limited distances, one from the other. He regards himself as one of those objects, an individual, alone, independent, free of any bindings, free to think and act and do as he desires. His very breathing he regards as his own breathing, and his actions are, to his thinking, his alone. Let us look within the thinking brain, and in doing so imagine one thinking individual male unit upon one planet of one atom of the brain, seeing his universe as man sees his. The appearance of the universe to this unit would be exactly the same to him as is man's universe to man. The objects within his vision would be separated by relative distance. Vast spaces would intervene between him and the vast suns in his starry heavens. Their luminosity would, to him, be relatively the same. For the positive nucleus of every system is a light-giving sun. 
and also would their relative motion be the same for a trillion revolutions per second of a light unit would be just as relatively slow to him as a day is to man periodicity of evolution is as relative as the appearances it records is it not then just as reasonable for this diminutive thinking unit of man to think himself one in a vast universe as for man to do so would it not be just as difficult for him to realise that he is just one apparent unit of the whole as it is for man to do so and as it is with this diminutive unit in high universe within man's brain so it is with man in his objective universe one is thinking man's thinking functioning in the evolution of the idea of man and he cannot do otherwise if he will the other is thinking the universal idea functioning in the evolution of the divine conception and he cannot do otherwise if he will every in-breathing and out-breathing of ether is the in-breathing and out-breathing of the living universal one every thought and every action are in accord with the universal pulsations of action and reaction of the process of thinking and they cannot be otherwise instinct consider the manifestation known as instinct the beaver builds his dam a marvellous feat of engineering was he taught to do it would he not do it just the same and just as perfectly if his parents and all associates were killed and he matured alone how does he do it instinct one answers the bee builds his marvellous cells the spider his web the barn swallow builds in barns and the chimney swallow in chimneys the robin flies south and north according to the season instinct makes them do it they cannot do otherwise says science just so they cannot do otherwise nor can any of us or any creating thing do otherwise than that which it thinks and has thought for countless periods of reappearance these acts are all acts of thinking mind we collected dynamically the idea of its evolution which has been recorded as memory in motion in inertia during ages of building beaver dams and honeycombs and spider webs and during ages of migration and nest building and other characteristics of the evolving manifestation of the divine concept as a whole imagination consider that manifestation of recollection known as imagination the quality of imagination varies in accordance with the ability to recollect memory recorded in the soul and with the ability to think in light to think in light is to think in higher octaves of the inner subjective mind to think in light is to disassociate the outer objective mind from the inner to blot it out as though that octave of integration had not yet been the outer mind is concerned primarily with continuance of the body as an appearance of existence and is not all that concerned or interested in much of anything else the outer mind of man or the lion the dog or elephant is absolutely the same man differs from the animal only in his ability to think in higher octaves and bring back to his outer mind recollection the perception of existence stored in motion and inertia in the memory of his universality this perception of all knowledge suspended within motion in inertia inspires within man that which he thinks is new knowledge and he adds it to his thinking he again writes it upon his soul man does not realize that what he considers new idea brought into appearance of existence is but old ideas stored within him projected upon the outer plane of his thinking inspiration when man gives to other men the inspiration which has come to him he is a divine messenger of the living god delivering to man his revelation from the holy of holies the genius the super thinker with imagination who brings beauty to the world is inspired man thinking in light the greater the imagination the greater the perception of the reality of universal existence hence the greater the intelligence the lesser the imagination the greater the reality of the appearance of existence the greater the imagination the nearer to oneness and the farther from the animal 
the inspired genius of great imagination has great intelligence. He is able to use his knowledge creatively. Those things which he desires to know, he may know. The humble poet, inspired by knowledge conveyed to him by contemplation of the orbs of night, may give to man a message of truth, which will outlive long generations of the learned, whose disapproved facts have died in the proving. The prophets were super-thinking men of great genius. The prophets bad knowledge of the causes of things, and could foretell their effects. Comprehension of the effect of a cause is not prophecy. Out of knowledge of the beginnings of things is born the imaginings concerning future things. The weather forecast for tomorrow is not prophecy. It is an act of intelligence born of knowledge. Genius is the forerunner of civilization. Genius knows the ecstasy of the high heavens and the mountain top. Genius is the bridge between man and God. He who will may cross it. Genius is locked within the soul of every man. He who wills may unlock its doors and know its ecstasy. Genius gives to man that which alone endures, which man has named art. No work of man can endure which is not born of inspiration and created in ecstasy. Genius gives to man idea, rhythm and form, which are of the soul, and beyond which in the created universe there is nothing. Genius knows no limitations within those which are universal. Genius knows love and truth in all their fullness. Genius translates the word of the universal one into the word of man for the soul of man. They who attain the ecstasy of genius are ordained messengers of the universal one. Genius lifts man from the lowly stage of ferment. Man still is new. He is still but in the ferment. Genius lifts brute man to gentle man. Genius gives to man the harmonies of universal rhythm, without which all is discord. Genius gives to man knowledge which is of the soul. He who tunes his heart to the messages of genius purifies himself. No impurity can there be in his heart, for verily he then is in communion with the Holy One. The pure in heart know their universality. Man may know his oneness. He who listens to the translations of genius knows the word of creation. He knows the rhythm of the universal language of light speaking in his inner mind. Genius awaits him who listens. The messages of genius are for the inner mind alone. The outer mind comprehends them not. To him whose inner mind is quickened into ecstasy, God speaks from the trees of the forest and he understands. To him the silent voice of nature speaks, with understanding, from the babbling brook and the pondering sea. He knows all things. To him universal mind unfolds truth, from the light of the sun and the blue dome of the heavens. He has all knowledge. To him the rosy dawn and the golden autumn sing messages which are to him as an anointing from the Holy One. He knows no limitations. He who has not ears to hear crucifies genius. The penalty of genius is crucifixion. The reward of genius is immortality. Whom man crucifies does he glorify with immortality. Seven cities ward for Homer being dead, who living had no roof to shroud his head. Genius desires no reward. The glory of genius is humility. Genius knows not the taint of arrogance. Conclusion Man has all knowledge within himself. Inspiration will unlock the doors of all knowledge. All knowledge exists in its entirety in all the universe. All knowledge, being universal, exists in man. The universe is omniscient. The universe is indissolubly united. Omniscience is of the electron the atom, the magnetic field of the atom, the molecule, the mountain, the man, the plant, the air, the water, the fire, the stars in the heavens, and the far reaches of space. The oneness of the universe allows no exceptions, no mistakes, no error in all its inclusiveness. 
Nothing is omitted from the entirety of the universal mind. There is all knowledge in all matter. There is all intelligence in all matter. All matter is spirit. Spirit is God. God is universal. God is all. One. The creating universe of matter appears through the centripetal, contractive, endothermic, charging, positive force of gravitation, which attracts. Disappears through the centrifugal, expansive, radioactive, exothermic, discharging, negative force of radiation, which repels. And reappears through the union of both forces, by regenerative impact in inertia.